discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce the main event of the conference, an excellent panel discussion entitled Restarting the Global Tourism Industry Strategies for the Future. Let me please introduce to you the two panel moderators, uh, Professor Dimitrios Buchalis, who is a strategic management and marketing expert with specialization in information community te communication technology application in the tourist travel, hospitality and leisure industries. She's director of the eTourism Lab and deputy di director of the International Center of Tourism and Hospitality Research at Bournemouth University Business School in England. I would really like to thank Professor Buchalis for his valuable help on establishing this panel and his contribution to our conference. Uh, the second moderator is Professor Evangelos Christou. He is Professor of Tourist Marketing and Dean of the School of Economics and Business at the International Hellenic University. He has served as President of Eurocree and as a member of the Board of Direction of International Cree. Uh, and Dimitri and Evangelos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anestis. Thank you very much. Dimitrios, I think we have uh, first in our panel, uh, Chris Tari. Chris Tari established uh, Citera in 2002, after almost 20 years uh, as a leading self-site analyst in the city of London, focused on aviation and transport. Citera provides consulting services and advice to private and public sector organizations in a number of countries. Uh, he has served, Chris Tari has served as a special advisor on aviation policy to government departments, regulators, and the UK Parliament, amongst others. He's a member of a number of industry panels, advisory councils, and advisory boards. His undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in economics, and he's a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society and of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, and a liveryman of the Honorable Company of Pilots. He's also a visiting professor in aviation strategy at Coventry University. Dimitrios? Thank you, uh, Vangelis. Uh, let's welcome our colleagues and our friends who are on this panel. The idea was to bring the some of the key uh, players from around the world and uh, bring the, the latest kind of information on how we can engage in the reignition or restart of the tourism industry. Um, so we have invited colleagues from different organizations and uh, Vangelis has already uh, introduced Chris. Uh, but uh, before we go to Chris, um, I'm just gonna say a couple of words about the structure of what we're doing. Um, we are looking at the strategies for the future and we are, we've got the first panel that is bringing some of the global policy makers and bring different organizations from around the world, the WTA, the WTO, the European Travel Commission, PATA. And then the second part, uh, we have got some analysts and futurists uh, and some colleagues who are dealing with uh, big data and they're analyzing that. Uh, but before we start the policy makers, I've asked Chris Starry, who is, uh, as, as Vangeli said, is the expert on, on air transportation. He has done a fantastic job uh, in during the COVID era uh, in, in predicting what's gonna happen and, and giving advice to many airlines around the world on how things are gonna go. Chris, welcome. Uh, it's lovely to see you, and I've, I was just reading your white paper that you produced yesterday about going back to the future. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Chris? I can hear you very well, but I have a problem with my video, and I've tried resetting it, so I'm afraid it's just going to have, have to be my name, and I can see you all. Uh, so many apologies for that. It's the first time I haven't been able to join by video, but um, you know, ready to participate in whatever way helps the panel. Uh, and the group. So, um, you know, wh whatever structure you like, Dimitros. Thank you. Chris, I know that you're time constrained and I know that Fitur is here as well. So we are a little bit constrained by time. So Chris, uh, I'd like you to take us through um, some of your predictions and what's happening in terms of the airline industry around the world and particularly to take us through um, your latest white paper that you talked about, you know, how can we recover in, in air transportation? And obviously I would like you uh, to, to talk about the big airlines, but also, you know, the low the low cost airlines. And if, and if you can, the charter airlines as well, because uh, a lot of people are in Greece and they are looking to the charter airline sector as well. Okay. I think, uh, th thank you very much indeed for the kind uh, introduction and invitation to speak. Um, 
Just to confirm, how long would you like me to speak for? Because as, as, as you know, I can speak um, without limit. So. I think we, we have got about 10 to 15 minutes for, okay. for you. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, 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 I will keep it uh, very much to that. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's me, is it? I think it is. Oh, goodness me. I do beg your pardon. Sorry. It's I'm the sorry. ringtone sorry being the it's same. From it's a ringtone different. I didn't recognise. I'm not having a good technology day today, so many apologies for that. No worries. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think if we, yeah, I, one of I, I just joined and um, you know what I, I, I cannot remember who was saying it, but uh, we were looking beyond COVID and um, for the last year or so. Uh, yes, I've written various things about saying you know what's what's happening now, what's been happening. I think we have to look forward and have to look through to what um, and how the industry will first of all restart, it will recover, and then we go back to growth. And the fundamental elements of growth remain. And it's no surprise to see that um, we've got some airline CEOs, EasyJet CEO yesterday saying, well, the pent up demand. We know the pent up demand. We ran surveys last year, as no doubt a number of you did as well. And it was very clear that the first thing people wanted to go and do is see their friends and relatives. They wanted to go and have a holiday. Um, and, you know, the, the sector that would lag behind that was, would, would, would be business travel. We haven't seen anything over the last 14, 15 months to suggest the outcome is or the, or the recovery is going to be any different. If we look at where there are large domestic markets, so we saw China, first of all, um, we look at uh, the US, where in the US we're looking at something where traffic is back to uh, in the domestic market, probably 75% of what it was in 2019. Overall, it's back to about two thirds of the numbers going through the TSA checkpoints. And if we look at that uh, and set it against the background of the relative unimportance in, in terms of volume of international traffic, that gives a reasonable sort of view that uh, domestic is back to about three quarters of what it was. And it's all around the confidence to move ahead and whether in the words of Michael O'Leary earlier this week, it's driven by vaccinations uh, and that the vaccination progress gives confidence to pe for people um, to travel in their own right. And on the other side of um, on the other end of the, of the spectrum, that receiving destinations or receiving countries are quite happy to have these passengers come in. So we've got lots of moving parts there and we've run lots of scenarios uh, and um, you know, we can't call them forecasts uh, because, you know, the two critical elements of whether you're allowed into a country under what conditions and whether there is a friction there uh, through uh, testing or quarantine or whatever. And whether, uh, as in the case of the UK, we have a lot more countries who would want to receive us uh, as travellers out of the UK. But our conditions that we have this notion of an amber list where, yes, we can co comply um, to quarantine when we come back in and um, have, have, have the tests. The government is saying, well, you know, you can't possibly travel for holiday. But I, my own view, and as, as you mentioned to me, Shoss, in my paper, which is any, if anybody likes to see it, please let me know it, it, it's there. Um, you know, we suggest that maybe it's because we're unable to accommodate and um, check the paperwork of all those passengers coming back into the UK that is going to act as a constraint for the UK, saying lots more countries can be on the list. So after that preamble, if we look at it, um, I've written elsewhere and it's you know very firmly my view. Um, what we what we saw over the last um, 16, 17 months was uh, a dash on the part of airlines for what I would call survival capital. Uh, a lot of it has been debt. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of build up of debt. Uh, we've seen some equity come into businesses either through public markets or through government support. And one of the issues about government support coming in, um, it changes the dynamics. And I know uh, as a city analyst, we would close airlines, we would sell down airlines that had government stakes in. And the first question we get asked was, um, to what extent uh, is this company able to manage its own destiny? Uh, and to what extent can it um, uh, you know, act in the best interest of us as um, institutional investing shareholders. And that's going to change a little bit. You know, we've got the debates about for small countries and small national airlines um, where they are absolutely fundamentally important for tourism. 
I have always argued that you can um, apply a different set of metrics to measure the performance and the value from such airlines. And that's much more economic value. And it is the opportunity cost if that uh, connectivity uh, disappears. Now, we know for three months in the summer in normal conditions, uh, if a destination um, offers opportunity to make money, we'll get a lot of airlines serve that destination. It's the other nine months of the year which are fundamentally important to uh, the government and to that country. So um, a, few, few, uh, a few more sort of premises here. But what I see is the recovery, first of all, in short haul, visiting friends and relatives and leisure traffic, um, subject to the constraints on the market or market constraints being lifted. And by that, there were people find that um, you know, there is no quarantine at the destination they're going to originally, and certainly uh, acceptable quarantine or no quarantine when they return. And what's quite interesting, a year or so ago, we ran a survey and asked people if they had to go into quarantine at their destination, would they travel or not? And only 4% of people said they would travel. We asked the same question of what would happen if they had to go into quarantine when they returned. And 26% of people said they would travel. So I think, you know, we haven't asked it again. I think people have tended to get a little fed up with surveys and the survey response rates tend to fall. But I think um, if you, you know, you want to go away, uh, you can, you, 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 and you don't, you, you need a test, you know, the testing system will be put in place and you can test people in destination and whatever. So short haul leisure uh, and in a European context, that's Greece, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Portugal um, as, as the main sun destinations. We've seen Turkey, but again, um, Turkey certainly on the UK is, is on the red list. So you'd have to go into a hotel if you came back. But we've certainly seen um, within and we have to separate between us as an island where we are now uh, out of the EU and what's happening within the EU. And obviously in, in the last week, the discussion or, or the view that if you can demonstrate you've been vaccinated, you're able to travel freely and without constraint. So let's see what comes out of that. But we know short haul leisure, first of all, uh, we know visiting friends and relatives, both short haul and long haul. Uh, the Harris um, organization uh, ran many surveys last year in the US and one of the, uh, the consistent answer to the question of what are you missing most was your friends and relatives. So that will come back. And again, it's about confidence. So if I'm visiting my friends and relatives in a different country, I am comfortable with the circumstances and the environment of which I am in. Similarly, if I'm a leisure, leisure passenger, I'm happier to go closer to home. Uh, and by that, I don't mean just staying within my home country, but it's an it's a area I'm much more familiar with. Going long haul is seen to have slightly different risk or different perception, no matter how many different times you travel there. So long haul, so, I think, will take um, a, a greater period to come back. Short haul, once we're able to do it, will bounce back. Now, what we're looking at, and we've seen sort of comments from certainly uh, Ryanair uh, and EasyJet this week, about capacity coming back. EasyJet is putting less in uh, the current quarter, um, surprisingly, and there's a hope and an expectation we will see more markets open as we go into the July and August period. That said, you're looking at a only a very short period for airlines to generate all the cash they need, not only for their operations then, but for the winter. And my great fear is that we will see a very truncated summer period with the consequences of that on airline revenue, and that will mean uh, that uh, as we move into the winter, and unless we get the follow through and some business traffic coming back um, uh, on short haul, uh, it's going to be, uh, if you like, five, five and a half winter uh, periods equivalent to winter cash flow in a row, which makes it very difficult, which means that airlines will have to look at raising more money. We've seen um, more bond issues this uh, week where the coupon on them has uh, diminished. So Ryanair had an issue where I think the coupon was 0.875, which was about uh, 100 basis points better than the last one that they had. And um, you have other airlines, so it's a still, uh, it's still the, 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 the coupon on their debt is still between four and 10%. So it's a perception of the risk, and that's a reflection of how the markets expect their businesses to recover uh, and, uh, and relate to the cash flow. Because looking at it from a, um, for a taking a view of debt, you're looking at how the interest, uh, the, the, the probability of the interest is going to be paid. And certainly in short haul, short haul, low cost airlines have been able to address the debt market much more cheaply than, than other airlines. So going to your point, Demetrius, about the, the, what's going to happen by uh, airline type as I just sort of wrap up my sort of 10 minutes or so. Short haul leisure, uh, yeah. 
and uh, they will come back the quickest. But again, it's a function of when markets are open and how quickly they can gear up to put capacity in. Some will be able to do it more quickly than others because they've been keeping their pilots and crews current as we've gone through uh, the downturn. Ryanair made a key point that it is, um, you know, that, that it's been flying and using its crews, so they, they they can almost flip the button and and um, and turn it on again. Not quite like that. It's it's much more complicated than that. Those are in so short haul leisure, fine. Charter. Um, you know, as part of a group, uh, if it's part of an inclusive tour, that depends on their ability to sell the, the, the charter to sell the holiday uh, and the confidence, partly on the point of view of the consumer, either it's going to take place or they're going to get their money back. And certainly what we've seen over the last few months, when as soon as the market opened, we saw a lot more bookings or expectation of a market open much more many more bookings come in um but part of those that wasn't new cash necessarily coming into the business what it was was people using uh, credits or coupons or vouchers that they've been given when they weren't able to travel before um so uh, i know from my own experience i've got something booked in the late late september um i'm only exposed to 50 pounds for each of our travelers at the moment and i have the option to cancel it until quite near the date and get my money back so we've seen a change in that, those things. Long haul, I think, will take, um, as I say, a greater period of time to come back, other than in terms of um, people wanting to visit their friends and relatives. So um, for a uh, low cost sector, yeah, come back quickly. Uh, those with the lowest cost and within the, the industry, Wiz and Ryanair are seen to have the absolute lowest cost. Um, again, uh, Michael O'Leary is very clear and I absolutely agree with him because we've seen it every time we've had a dislocation in the market before that volumes come back first uh, as, as uh, airlines uh, see effectively the market clearing price. They then try and get the fares up and that's a function of how much capacity comes back in. If too much capacity comes in too quickly, they will not be able to exercise higher prices. It's exactly the same with fuel. And what we also have to be very clear from an airline point of view is we're seeing Brent Oil at the moment as the expectation the economic recovery is coming uh, up at $70 a barrel. Um, and again, you know, that's much higher than it, it's higher than it was in 2019. Uh, and that puts a great pressure and they will not be able to pass that on. So for the airline sector, it's pretty tough. Um, but as soon as they are able to fly, they will fly because uh, they want to get some cash in. Uh, and again, we've seen with the, the, the figures this week, um, you know, just how difficult this last quarter has been. Uh, long haul, I say, um, uncertain business travel. I think people are too pessimistic um, about the loss of business travel to video conferencing and the things like Zoom and whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, in a lot Chris, of sectors- I think I think this was the most uh, intense uh, airline analysis anybody can hear and certainly I've heard in the last yeah. uh, few months and absolutely fantastic for that. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions yeah, sure. uh, to, to, to elaborate on some of these things. Uh, I kind of feel that, um, first of all, of course, you identified that business travelers are not coming back. So that means that the revenues is not coming back to the airlines. So that means that a lot of airlines are not going to survive. So two questions here. One is, um, do you have the data in terms of what is the subsidy from in Lufthansa and some of the other big yep. airlines? The second thing is, um, who do you think is going to go under and who do you think is going to flourish in the future? Mm. And the third thing that's related to that is that, uh, do we see the end of the charter flights? If we've got, mm. you know, Ryanair, EasyJet, uh, Jet2, mm. and the, the, the types of, of, of BA and Lufthansa picking up some of the leisure routes, mm -hmm. do you think that it's the end of the charter flights? Yeah, I, uh, no, I haven't got all the figures to hand of where we've had support subsidy, um, but I can provide them. So I can provide them. So I, I will. Uh, I will. I, I've got a colleague who's put it all down. So I will send you that over, uh, Dimitros, uh, later today. Um, but essentially, what we have to look at it. Um, if we look at Lufthansa, for example, um, you know, in, in various countries, we've uh, all, all industries have been able to access what we would call furlough money. So um, support for labor, and it, it doesn't matter uh, where that is. In the UK, we've had something called the COVID Corporate Finance Recovery Scheme, 
and that's uh, where uh, essentially the, uh, the I think it's probably the Bank of England as the enabling entity, or the Treasury has bought bonds issued by effectively bonds issued by airlines to get money into the airlines, um, and that that's repayable uh, at um, I think it was 12, 18 months into the future. So you're you're, you're taking up debt. Um, we've seen debt to equity swaps uh, in the case of um, Air France, um, KLM, but where KLM, uh, the Dutch government was not supportive of it. So what we've seen is that the French government share in Air France KLM has gone up. They're holding more equity, moving towards 30 percent of the total. Um, and, you know, it, again, it comes back to you know 25 or so years ago when we start floating airlines owned by governments and they say, how much is the government involved? Um, you know, are the decisions really commercial decisions? Which is a slight, slightly in the side. In the case of Lufthansa, we had the government come in in a sort of what they called a silent participation uh, in terms of the equity in the business. But that is has a time date upon it where there are like almost penal rates of payment back if um, the government is not bought out. That is my understanding by by a particular time. So the focus and the impetus is is, is to replace. The government equity by new equity or, or or whatever so i think what what, what we've got um you know in, in, in other countries you know, again we look at alitalia and we look at some of the decisions by uh, the government where uh, where but by the eu where it appears that some grants have been um written off it said okay you can invest you can give um you know it, 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 what would be tantamount to state aid in in, in another uh, another era uh, to these airlines and what what we've argued and what we've always said is that yes people will act they will put money into an airline the airline will be saved uh and then there'll be, there'll be the debate with the lawyers and the economists and it will get sorted out or not later on um i think it, it comes down to it and again in certain and i've written various papers on this as well and you know you you look at it if, I, if i'm a small island nation and this is my year-round connectivity well i'm going to support it um there's no reason why, and it's almost like the theory of privatization and corporatization, there's no reason why this business shouldn't be as efficient as it possibly can be. Uh, and I will provide the minimum uh, that I need to to support and to get the economic connectivity that I need. And what I think we will see is, yes, we've certainly seen it. But if you're, let's say, a tourist dependent country, a tourist dependent uh, island or whatever, by definition, your uh, your tax, the revenues going into your treasury have been impacted by the absence of tourism, so you haven't got enough to go around. Um, but you need you need this airline. You need to uh, maybe you need to address the opportunity in a different way. And again, we've certainly been looking at how you could have virtual airlines, and it's even before COVID, years before, how smaller airlines could gain economies of scale by working as virtual airlines and you know you'd have somebody operate this you'd have they'd have the brand they'd have the market reach they may do their own network planning but somebody else will provide all all the, all the other services so i think we've got um we've got two things yes i think we haven't seen you know, in, in a positive way that many airlines fail yet because they've been supported against the background where i see for many airlines because of market closure or partial market closure or whatever, or uh, structure of traffic not coming back, we've got a very difficult winter coming up. So it's it's going to be equally bad, if not worse, than, than the previous winter, which has a direct implication on where is the cash going to come from. We've seen a lot of sale and lease backs of airplanes. We've seen some interesting values placed on aircraft to, to make the mathematics work, in, in my view. Um, but what we're seeing is there's not to, well, yes, um, there are more to come, but at what price? Um, we have to look at the balance sheets. The balance sheets are largely destroyed. The airlines are not going to trade their way to better balance sheets. So there's got to be a sufficiently strong equity story um, to, uh, to, to get new equity. But until we can see um, markets open, growth or recovery, then into growth, um, then I think it's going to be challenging. So I fear we will see more failures. But against that background, the capacity is not necessarily coming out of the market because the airplanes are not, other than very large aircraft, are not necessarily being cut up. So there's a market clearing price that aircraft are coming back in. And I'm working with somebody at the moment where we're seeing some very, very attractive lease rentals. You can reset the economics of your business uh, and you can do it in that way. And it's absolutely the case that lowest cost always wins. We've got a lot of airlines where the CEOs don't have a plan B. It's hanging on for the recovery. 
um, but they really need to restructure their businesses. So I, I'm not I'm not sure I've answered your questions in the right order, Demetrius, or even answered the questions at all. But I hope the observations have been helpful. I think you I think you did, Chris, and I think I promise you we'll do another seminar only with you for a couple of hours to actually explore all this knowledge because it's it's very condensed information for a lot of people to do but i think uh, but i think we'll keep your last word with restructuring the airline industry and i think i think you elaborated on all these factors that are coming forward to actually change uh, what we call the airline industry and i think the the, the whole world of tourism will kind of uh, see the impacts of that uh, sooner or later Yep, excellent. I, I absolutely agree. So, look, delighted to have been able to participate today. Um, if I, I don't know if, if there are any other questions before I disappear, or if you want me to come back in later, or, or you let me know what you will need me to do. Thank you very much, Chris. We'll move on with the program, but we'll be in touch, and I think we'll, we'll get uh, a, a session only with you and to look into the airline yeah, sure, uh, yeah. industry because it's it's happening very it's very very complicated. Yep. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. everybody. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Colleagues, we are now moving to the Global Policy Maker session where we've got uh, Alessandra Priande from the UNWTO, but I know that she's very much involved with uh, Fitur in Madrid right now, and she's promised that some states is going to spend some time with us. We've got Eduardo Santander. Eduardo, I can see your name. Uh, are you there? Eduardo is there. Uh, who's a very good and fantastic, wonderful friend. Um, we've got Liu Sizun from the World Tourism Alliance in China, and he has sent us a nice video that we're going to play afterwards. And we have got my good friend Mario Hardy all the way from Bangkok, I guess quite late in Bangkok. Uh, Mario, hello, uh, who is the outgoing chief executive of PATA. Uh, and, and Mario has been uh, in the driving seat of PATA for the last seven years. Um, so, uh, Vagelis, uh, can you please introduce Eduardo first to tell us about what's happening in Europe? and the restructuring, then our technicians would play the video from you uh, to talk to us about what's happening in China. And I'll keep, um, and I, I punish my friends in a way that I keep them towards the end because Mario can help us with um, bring all of those things together and see how the global industry is, is functioning. So let's go with that order, Vangelis. Absolutely, Demetrius, thank you very much. Eduardo Santander is the Executive Director and CEO of the European Travel Commission, an association of national tourism organizations created in 1948 to promote Europe as a tourism destination. In this role, Mr. Santander steers CTC's activities aimed at building the value of tourism for the countries of Europe through cooperation in sharing best practices, marketing intelligence, and promotion. Under his leadership, the European Travel Commission has extended its membership to private organization and academia with the launch of the associate membership program and developed a long-term strategic partnership with the European Commission for the promotion of destination Europe as a, in long haul markets. Mr. Santander has over 15 years of experience in tourist marketing, brand development, business consulting, advocacy and public affairs gained in diverse private companies and public institutions from the tourism and hospitality sector. Educated in Spain, the USA and Austria, he holds a PhD in sports sciences and an MBA degree with a focus on hospitality and recreation industry management. He's fluent in English, German, Spanish and Italian. Mr. Santander is a passionate advocate of freedom to travel, smart connectivity and sustainability in tourism and beyond. Demetrius. So, Eduardo, I know that there's been a horrible, horrible year and I'm grateful for all your leadership and bringing together um, so many different actors in a way. Please share with us your knowledge where we are and where we're going in the next few months and then longer term where we're going. First of all, thank you so much, um, Evangelos and uh, Dimitrios, uh, for the kind invitation. Um, Kalimera to everybody, and I'm really delighted to be here with you. Um, 
First of all, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And next time I, I should send the, probably the short bio and not the long one, uh, and just to make it easier for, for the audience, you know. Um, ultimately, what I am is, is an advocate of, uh, of sustainable change. Um, I think uh, uh, the pandemic in general terms, uh, both personally and professionally, um, mean for all of us that, you know, um, there's nothing more stable than change in our lives. And we see that the seek for perpetuity, uh, the seek uh, for maintaining the status quo, uh, for maintaining things as always were because they have worked for so many years, it's no longer a model for travel and tourism. Um, from a European perspective, I always say that we now are an inflection, we have this inflection um, point now um, that we have to decide or when we have to decide two concrete things, whether Europe wants to be the first or whether it wants to be the best. And, you know, there are a huge difference between them. And when we talk about first, and you always remember probably many presentations just a few months ago, we still live working, you know, like uh, Europe is uh, the most visited destination worldwide with, you know, half a billion people visiting Greece being one of the leader uh, destinations uh, within Europe for Europeans, but also for third country visitors. And um, obviously it was a model uh, completely oiled and working perfectly like a, like a Swiss watch um, with a exponential growth. As many other things have been seen in, you know, in, the, in the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, you know, with um, no signs of ending or no signs of... Uh, and then COVID happened, and uh, we got the, the big crash. We we uh, with that speed that we were we were having, we crashed against uh, a wall, and that um, it, it has waken up uh, many, and it has triggered that instinct of change that we all have in us. And um, not only for survival purposes, as it has been presented before by by Chris, and you know, obviously aviation is. Um, a huge part of the equation of this change, because obviously, you know, we have to move people from A to B and from B to A. So it's, uh, um, if tourism is um, willing to change the connection with the mobility sector um, is not only uh, important, but it's actually crucial. We need that uh, uh, vast majority of the tourism act or tourism, uh, the mere act of, of, of going to, to a vacation has to do with moving people from a place to another and how this will happen, in which mode it will happen this in the future. Now, what the situation is, uh, back to your initial question, uh, Dimitrios, where we are today, and this is very timely, this, uh, this uh, conference today, this opportunity to share with people, probably uh, very well um, recorded by the, by the media and covered by the media, by the Greek media to probably today and international media is that uh, we got an agreement, we got this uh, white smoke yesterday from the negotiations between the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. For those less familiar with the European institutions, you know, one is political body, you know, the, uh, people elected by, by the people of Euro in, in European elections, and the second one is the executive body, and the third one, the Council, is the government of the, of the European Union, so the, the single national governments of the member states. That, um, yeah. So we had a huge issue there because we um, were advocating, we've been lobbying heavily for um, finding common solutions, digital solutions, the famous uh, digital uh, certificate that now it's called, by the way, digital COVID certificate, no longer digital green certificate. So it's just a new nomenclature. But we, we got a compromise among the, the block, meaning that the 27 member states agreed on the, um, finally and approve, you know, the, the, the use of a certificate EU-wide. This is not only relevant, this is the only solution that actually we had, and it's going to be used. So now it's obviously a matter of implementation in the, just a few weeks that we have until the beginning of uh, July. We saw with a um, lot of um, impetus and also a lot of uh, motivation, you know, they announced openings from the Greek government, from the Italian government, from Cyprus, most recently, the announcement from the UK to its restrictions. But what we wanted to see is exactly what happened. You know, it's not like a common approach, a harmonized solution, um, and definitely... Yeah. Eduardo froze for a minute. 
And um, for people who do not know is that uh, yesterday the European uh, Union announced the COVID certif certificate uh, approach to, to driving uh, uh, the, 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 the trips within uh, Europe and also uh, between some third countries. Eduardo, you froze for a minute and I was covering the time. So, Sorry for uh, that. That's, uh, that's a problem okay. with the digitalization the sector. I think we, yeah, we, okay. we, are, we are talking about like also infrastructure problems, you know, even in the capital of Europe here in Brussels, you know, like uh, internet can be very unstable sometimes and uh, it has nothing to do with my computer or anything, but it's just like an old cable on the street that uh, <laughs> cutters for many okay. neighbors. So you were time, saying about the decision yesterday. Uh, yeah. And you were saying about, so uh, people that they'll travel to Europe, they will either have got to have the two doses of the, of the vaccine, if they're doing the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca, the one dose of the Johnson. And then they either have got to go to had COVID before, or they would have, uh, they need the PCR test. Is that right? Exactly. So the, the aim of this digital COVID certificate is to obviously uh, to provide it is a tool for traveler it is a, a, an enabler uh, of uh, traveling within the european union and beyond i will explain that later um, and it aims you know to uh, demonstrate people's proof of uh, vaccinations you were saying immunization or you know a negative test um, however you know the the biggest issue of this is you know obviously it's uh, that it should be not non-discriminatory so obviously some people would not like to be vaccinated some people cannot be vaccinated some people will not be vaccinated on time for this summer. So how do you deal with this uh, very basic principle of non-discrimination, which is one of the pillars of the European Union, by the way. So, um, And they have found a solution with that. Um, and uh, maybe the great achievement is the world quarantine and the, you know, the, the uh, imposing quarantines on traveler is completely out of the table and it's obviously not recommended. There is a little close though, that in case of force majeure, again, member states, will be able to uh, close their borders. Of course, that was never the competence of the European Union and border control is it's, uh, very much still the competence of every single member state. But we are very confident that this uh, will boost uh, not only um, travel confidence, which is there already. I mean, I, we've seen uh, uh, from previous speakers that the demand is there. You know, we have uh, huge peaks of demands now from the beginning of the government. You know, it's an, it's an issue now of capacity and uh, the verification process of uh, of um, this new digital certificate is, is that going to cost time at um, entry gates, uh, airports, uh, airlines? It, um, who is going to do the control? Um, where do we can you know? There's a lot of questions, and uh, obviously the devil resides always in the in the detail. Um, but I think. Politically, Eduardo, you are sitting in, in Brussels, so you know what's happening with all the different kind of pressures from different groups. How do you see that um, moving forward? Uh, who are the supporters or what are the different views? What well, we've, you we've heard uh, about fierce uh, discussions uh, during the, the negotiations, uh, but, you know, again, it's been uh, anonymously approved, uh, meaning that all members are on the same page now. Um, this aims also to avoid competitive advantages and you know, avoiding competitive disadvantages because obviously while some countries would have done again bilateral, unilateral, multilateral agreements or you know, corridors if you want, you know, these would have provoked again a you know, Europe of different speeds you know, and also you know, it would have been a chaos also for the aviation industry you know, because they would have had to reroute a lot of their charters as you were mentioning before but also you know, very, you know, the, their normal slots you know, that they have. So I think we'll find a very, I think the only compromise that we could find, uh, and uh, it had cost a lot of months and a lot of uh, work um, from side of the stakeholders, but also, you know, the government's uh, working uh, very hard in the backs and the diplomacy. I would not like to, you know, I think, you know, the, the problem is solved, so it's not, there's no point to see who was in favor or not. So I think now everybody's in favor. Uh, but the issue, Dimitrios, is, you know, how is this going to work? You know, the principle is agreed, but, you know, now we have to put people uh, in each member state to prove, you know, the, the you know, to uh, roll out a verification um, uh, process that should be very much uh, standardized within the European Union. And also, you know, to get um, everybody not only vaccinated, but also, you know, with a digital proof of their vaccination, which, as we know, in Europe, it's pretty okay. Um, and I go to the second point of my intervention, which is, you know, how this is going to affect also 
uh, countries of uh, third countries uh, like the uh, United States, China, Southeast Asia, you know, common bees, very um, uh, good visitors to Europe during summer season, uh, very loyal visitors, also diaspora tourism. Imagine um, how many Americans also visit uh, Greece uh, in the summer or, you know, the Irish diaspora from the United States and Canada going back to Ireland in the summer. So I'm, I'm talking about how is this going to work also for, for these uh, countries uh, where we know, you know, for instance, the United States that people didn't get uh, their vaccination digitalized and they got the shot and they got a piece of paper and that was it. Um, and in some cases they were digitalized, but, you know, I was told yesterday that um, only one third of those vaccinated have, have been put in a database or, you know, have been added to a database, which is uh, obviously it's, it's a problem that we have because, you know, there has to be an agreement in how um, um, you will be allowing people to enter Europe uh, that say that they have been vaccinated, but, you know, they have to demonstrate and that cannot be demonstrated with a piece of paper, as you can imagine. So there is a lot of com conversation about that. China, it's another story. Um, China um, will have to provide reciprocity also for EU citizens um, to entry China, which is not the case yet. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Chinese government have very much digitalized the whole process of vaccination. So there won't be a huge problem with the reassumption of operations between China and Europe, as long as there's political willingness to do so. America is, for me, the, the biggest question mark, as is the most important market, source market from outside the European Union in the summer season. Um, and needless to say that, you know, within the European Union, we, we see also a lot of... Uh, moves from government also now, not only into vaccination strategy, but also, you know, like a, a... Eduardo froze again. The Brussels internet well, it happens is... in life, uh, in life, yes, of course. See, it's usual. Let me take the opportunity to see if Alessandra is here. I can see the name. Alessandra is here as well. Yay. So let's see if Eduardo comes Alexandra back. Alessandra has been here for a while, listening to Eduardo Santander. Fantastic. Every I time I, I'm here, I'm all I'm going go to meetings, I get to listen to Eduardo Santander. That is fantastic. Uh, let's see if Eduardo defreezes. And, oh, and de then uh, he is defreezes. He has defrozen. So, okay. Um, so, Eduardo, you. Uh, please conclude, and then we're we're going to uh, to Alessandra. And, yeah, long um, long long story short, you know, things are resuming uh, very op in a very optimistic way. I think you know we're, we're going to have a summer. It's going to be a, an extended summer in terms of uh, a season. There is this possible income. People who are willing to travel. Destinations are getting ready. Um, there are reasons to celebrate, but obviously, you know, we'll keep an eye open on on you know new developments uh, from a health point of view. The health authorities still saying that we should not be traveling. So it's still a little bit of a, of a paradox there. As you've heard from the World Health Organization yesterday, that, that they're still not recommending to open to international travel. Um, but I think once, you know, the levels also of infection continue um, being very low and, you know, almost no deaths recorded in Europe in the last 24 hours and so on, we'll see that all the reasons for, you know, for restrictions, all the, uh, the reasons for, um, you know, protecting vulner vulnerable populations will not be longer valid. And therefore, you know, obviously there will not be more justification to um, um, forbid uh, travel or to not restrict travel more. Um, again, you know, very optimistic uh, news for us, very fresh news from yesterday. And I think we, we should be doing one of these uh, webinars again, you know, hopefully in, in beautiful Crete, as I saw the video before, and instead of in this horrible Zoom that uh, freezes all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. Vageli said he's going to buy the drinks uh, uh, when, when we get together. Thank you very much, Eduardo. You, can you stay with us? Or yes, of course. Next yeah, half an hour? yeah, okay, yeah fantastic. No. So let's uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. Let's go to Alessandra. And I know that Alessandra is under uh, time pressure, and I'm very grateful for her to be here, especially during Fitur time. Uh, Vagelis is going to do a short introduction to you, and then uh, the floor is yours, Alessandra. Well, uh, we have the honor to be with uh, Alessandra Priante, the Regional Director for Europe for the World Tourism Organization. Alexandra Priande is the director for Europe of, of uh, UNWTO, the United Nations agency that promotes sustainable, responsible, and universally accessible tourism. 
She was previously the chief of multilateral relations and tourism policy in Italy for the ministries where tourism was positioned. Ministry of Culture and subsequently the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Forestry Policies. She is a first degree business graduate at Bocconi University in Italy and holds an executive MBA from uh, Luis Guido Carli University. She merged her experience in corporate finance and M&A operations with her cultural expertise, joining since 2002 the Ministry of Culture with the task of restructuring public finances for the culture sector in Italy. As an expert of the Middle East area, she was appointed from 2010 to 2015 as the diplomatic cultural representative for the Gulf area. Alessandra knows six languages and is an author of numerous sector publications. She is also an adjoint professor at Lewis Business School and teaches culture and tourist management and other, at other major universities in Italy and many other countries. Dimitrios. And Alessandro has not slept a lot for the last year because with Secretary General Zurapol Kasvili and all the WTO colleagues have been uh, leading the recovery and the restart process uh, of tourism globally. Alessandra. Tell us what's happening, uh, tell us the latest news, tell us how optimistic you are, and tell us what we can do to help restarting tourism. First of all, thank you, Dimitris. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I've done all I could. I quit start, cut my presentation in the other conference, and I just ran over to you. It's a pleasure being among friends. And I have to tell you, it's really a pleasure working in tourism right now. I might sound crazy, but you know, I joined the UNWTO as director of Europe in the end of 2019, basically. And uh, three months after, pandemic. So, you know, definitely you ask yourself, okay, what am I doing? Is this the sector? I try to also sometimes, you know, wear the trousers of the students that maybe two years ago they said, ah, oh, wow, I want to pursue a career in the tourism. And that now with uh, percent of micro, small and medium enterprises at risk, especially in Europe, you know, with no real visibility of when to restart, obviously, you know, everything is a little bit at stake. Nevertheless, I'm still crazily enough, incredibly positive, And I've probably had the best time of my life. I completely hate virtual. Virtual is destroying my body because I'm not walking anymore. I'm just sitting and looking at talking to computers. My relationship, because my husband is fed up of hearing me talk every day in the house. And, you know, I really want to go back to normal. And I also, but I, I'm so grateful that through this time, we all had an opportunity, which is really, because we all had an opportunity to talk at a more equal level. Everybody very ready to listen and especially stakeholders, ministers, and everybody that was involved in tourism, understanding the power of the industry they had in their hands. To be honest, tourism has never been so much in the mouth of everybody like now. We have, and that was one of my legacies, advanced very much uh, with you and you and WTO with the relations with the European institutions, Eduardo can be a, a testament to that as well. And uh, do you all, all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. Hello? Yeah, we're good. Hello, yeah. do you all hear me properly? Yes. Yes, Alessandro, it's very good. Good, excellent. No, because I'm, seeing, because I'm seeing everybody frozen. So I had a moment of, let's say, let's see if I'm talking alone or not. But what I'm saying is which, is, which is important to highlight, we managed, UNWTO is now uh, talking directly with all the European institutions and we're in very high position with the European institutions uh, in the sense that they're now realizing, I mean, obviously for the very wrong reasons because we needed to wait for a pandemic to happen, but they're now realizing how important the tourism sector is. We've been talking, how, much, how many times, uh, Dimitrios, in our, you know, in our, teaching moments and we've been talking about tourism being the, the one with the largest value chain ever and uh, uh, we are now confronted realizing how important is tourism because it's so horizontal and so large we've done estimates i 
obviously don't want to bore you with our numbers. I encourage you to go through them. They're all available in UNWTO.org, but we are estimating just in 2020, a loss of 100, more than 120 million direct tourism jobs. And we're still at the half of 2021. So we still are losing jobs because really things have restarted, but have not. So definitely we need to be very, very practical because on the one hand, we need to continue supporting the, the, the governments in their, their, in their vision, reinforcing their commitment to tourism and also to tourism with sustainable and innovative uh, ways of actually taking things forward. But we also have to make sure that the dialogue between the public sector and the private sector it advances to levels that were never probably reached before. I can tell you one thing, for example, Spain, I commend the efforts of Spain in actually making this fair happen. It wasn't easy. We all had to do a PCR before entering, they were doing antigen tests, but it was easy, the Spanish way, because Spain is so organized as a country, we could actually you know, get our digital ticket and there's a moment where you can upload your PCR test into the uh, into your profile and basically you can scan your QR code and enter. And this is what the EU Digital Green Pass is all about. So that is, to me, it's called facilitating, which is very important. Why? Because if there's one thing we've lost in this year and a half, we didn't just lose tourists. We've lost the spirit of tourism. We've lost the confidence, the trust in the unknown, which is the essence of tourism is I want to go and explore a new destination. You know, we are now in mentally and thankful, very thankful to Madrid because for example, Madrid has never closed anything. So we did have this feeling, yes and no, but I've had the chance to actually travel in this last two months and including my own country, people are nervous, they're shocked. And if you tell them, go out for a weekend, take a flight, which means, 72 hours before PCR and then this, and then you have to do the PCR before you return. And then you have to clarify, people are not going. They're not going anywhere, they're staying. So- It's a matter of, it's a matter thing, of attitude uh, from what you said, Alessandra. Yeah, it's, it's a, a matter, matter of, of it's a matter of- And mental It's a matter thing. of, yes. And this is, I think, one of the things when we talk about sustainability, definitely we need to advance together in the in the economic and environmental sustainability agenda but there's one thing we need to consider now which is going to be the greatest impact of all is the social cost of this pandemic and that social cost includes everything it includes unemployment includes you know uh, as you called it mental stability in the sense of you know that security and safe aspect which allows us to actually go on vacation with a light mind and actually seek actively. So we sort of need to, as if we're re-educating, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry if I use this, this parallel because it might not be one of the happiest, but it, as if we are taking somebody who had an injury or maybe an accident and you need to slowly re-educate. Rehabilitation. Yes. It's rehabilitation. We have to take them and us by the hand and also we have to bear into, in, into our vision the fact that the small and micro enterprises need all our attention now because we thought that they were the future and they are the future, okay? But at the moment, they might not exist anymore. I've seen global writers being former uh, travel agency owners, global writers, old man, sorry, apologies, older man, who would be on their bicycle delivering because they have three kids at home. And I'm not, not being extreme, I'm being real. So I think what we need to do now, and that's why to go back to your original question, that's why I'm immensely grateful to the vision of the secretary general for, having, for him having brought me in, for me having passed the harsh selection of 200 and over candidates for the directorate of Europe. But I'm grateful I'm here because I am in a position where I can see from a larger perspective. And I can actually be helping and supporting together with all my fantastic colleagues from the other regions, from the operational departments. I don't think in UN we, we've ever, you know, really understood as well the power of our role until now as United Nations. You know, we really wore the blue helmets for tourism. And now we have a whole line of things in support 
for innovation, for education. We have product development, strategy advisory. We took on board EBRD and World Bank to help us assist the member states. So we draw on the MST, Measuring Sustainable Tourism Standards. So we're, we're going like, we're all advancing on this and we are at the service of the world of tourism, obviously. And we are very grateful for that. You'll recall that last time we met was in Athens in uh, 2000, it was 17th of February, 2020, when I escaped uh, the hostel to come and see you and, and Zura uh, when you were in Athens. And, um, and, 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 and I follow obviously what, what's happening and I'm contributing and, and it has been a, a year and a half almost of extraordinary developments. And, and we're Thank very you. grateful for everything that you're doing. Thank you. I know, I know, Alessandro, you are in between events. So thank you very much for your contribution. We appreciate it. Thank that. you, my dear. Thank you for having me. The only thing I want to tell you, you might see us again in Athens, because as you know, yes, we are having our first physical regional commission in Athens. In June. And, and uh, yes. I hope to be there. Which, which days is it? It's uh, uh, regional commission is on the 3rd of June and then we're, we're having a huge conference the day after. So we will be arriving uh, early enough to Athens and we'll be very happy to see all of you. And, I hope uh, to, to catch up with you in Athens. Um, definitely, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for thank you, having Alexandra. me. And obviously, please Dimitrios, uh, I want you all, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put on the chat my email so that Thank you very I much. Mean, you anybody that. that doesn't know me, of course, I have a lot of friends here, but anybody that doesn't know me, if you want to get in touch, anything you need from you, and that's your, we're at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, let's, let's move to China and uh, see the video from you. And then our good friend, Mario Hardy, who has been with us for a long time, who will kind of um, go on around to, to see everything on the policy. Now, I've taken the liberty to ask uh, Vagelis on the background if we can if we can delay this uh, session because of all the fantastic speakers we have got, and I think we can okay. we can extend for another half an hour or so. So uh, we'll have the opportunity to harness the uh, all, all the knowledge. So Vagelis, let's play the video, and you, can you introduce okay. Mr. Liu? Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Liu Xinjun is uh, the Secretary General of the World Tourism Alliance. He brings with him a very extensive, well-rounded wealth of experiences, education, and top positions in the travel and tourism industry in China and across the world. Prior to his position at the World Tourism Alliance, he served as the Director General at the Department of Marketing and International Cooperation of the China National Tourism Administration. He has also served as Secretary General of the China Tourism Association and at very and at many other very important positions. So let's see his very, very interesting video right now. Dear moderators, industry friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and privilege to attend this Tournament 2021 conference and join with you in discussing the future of global tourism. While the COVID-19 pandemic is still spreading and causing serious disruptions to the world and tourism environment, our meeting today sends a message of hope and confidence for the recovery of the global tourism economy. As you know, China is the host country of both the headquarters and the secretariat of the World Tourism Alliance. So I'm able to share with you firsthand the experiences of our tourism sector in containing the pandemic and promoting a sustainable post-COVID recovery. As you are all too painfully aware, the novel coronavirus has been and still is rampant across the world. In the face of the pandemic, the Chinese government has unified and let the entire country or 6.9 million square kilometers of it in an ongoing battle with this microscopic virus that has inflicted micro damage. Through painstaking efforts, China has achieved the major strategic outcomes in pandemic control and achieved significant economic and social development progress. 
through an unrelenting implementation of our regular containment measures and a nationwide vaccination program. I'm pleased to report that the epidemic situation in China is well under control and continues to improve. Chinese tourists have always shown a strong propensity to travel and spend, and that continues to this day. According to statistics from the Chinese Ministry of Culture and Tourism, domestic tourists made 102 million person trips during this year's Qingming Festival holiday from April 3rd to 5th, recovering to 94.5% of the 2019. <coughs> The five-day Labor Day holiday from May 1st to 5th saw an even bigger increase with 230 million domestic trips undertaken, an increase of close to 120% year-on-year and raising more than 3% above the pre-COVID level. These encouraging figures mark a strategic turning point in the recovery of the tourism market and their regular epidemic control. Rainbows only appear after a storm, and challenges are always present opportunities. To absorb the full impact of the pandemic, we've acted in the spirit of solidarity by pulling together both our efforts and our resources. Out of the turmoil and confusion of this pandemic, we have developed a new and effective cooperation platform that encompasses the government stewardship, industry-wide coordination, and business partnership. First, the government and other public sectors have played a leading role in introducing support policies to help tourism enterprises and tourist service providers survive through the recent difficulties. The National Development and Reform Commission the Ministry of Culture and Tourism and other Chinese government departments have launched a wide range of relief measures. With travel agencies, airlines, hotels, and other tourism businesses as top priorities, these policies are aimed at minimizing the losses incurred by the tourism sector as a result of this pandemic, including the following. A return of 80% service quality deposit paid by travel agencies during the pandemic period. Use of the Tourism Development Fund as loan subsidies. Prioritizing the tourism sector with financial support and tax reduction. And supporting tourism enterprises by organizing online skill training during the Windows period of the pandemic. At the provincial and city level, preferential policies have also been initiated to support the operation of the tourism companies, including tax and fee cuts, special funding support, construction of tourism projects, credit support, tourism benefiting policies, and tourism promotion and marketing. These initiatives have energized and boosted the recovery and revitalization of the tourism sector. At the same time, stimulus vouchers have been issued in various localities, and some Chinese cities have issued several rounds of vouchers. According to initial 36, at least 30 cities have introduced the vouchers and other policy initiatives to stimulate consumption and energize demand. All of these together have played a significant role in stimulating domestic demand, stabilizing employment, boosting confidence, and promoting economic recovery. Second, the business sector has actively responded to the crisis through innovation. Tourism companies are the pillars of the travel and tourism sector, and in the face of this uh, pandemic, they have taken innovative steps to manage the crisis and overcome its unprecedented challenges. To boost the cash flow, for example, Trip.com, Mafumu, and other OTAs sold options of future tourism products at discounted prices, while also allowing tourists to receive a full refund 
should they choose not to exercise their options. The Trip.com group provided 1 billion yuan of funding support and 10 billion yuan of micro loans to its platform partners in their air ticketing, hotel, travel, and vacation businesses. While Tongchen Tourism sold daily necessities through its physical stores and sales network with excellent resort, of course. Significantly, all of these companies have avoided mass layoffs during the pandemic. Their management teams voluntarily accept lower or zero salaries and have maintained stable labor relations with their employees through rotations and staggered working hours. While waiting for the recovery of the tourism market, these companies have reoriented their business plans and invested in employee training. They also use this time to review their business operations and marketing campaigns to develop better plans for the future. They encourage the employees to share their stories on social media to help them maintain good relations with their customers. They also increase efforts in capacity building, explore new approaches to development, and optimize new technologies, including 5G, big data, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence to accelerate digital transformation, promote innovation in tourism products and business models, and improve the quality of tourism development and delivery. In addition to meet the requirements of pandemic containment, city sports, amusement parks, hotels, museums, and other venues equipped it themselves with the necessary personnel and facilities. Enhance the cleaning and disinfection, rigorously management of visitor flows and social distancing safety protocols have become standard procedures. The system of ticket reservation, limited access, temperature scanning, and health code is strictly implemented in all tourist attractions across the entire country. Multiple measures have also been taken to ensure the safe and orderly opening of tourism attractions. The resilience and commitment demonstrated by tourism companies during this pandemic have boosted the confidence of the tourism community and fostered a positive image for the sector as a whole. Third, the Chinese initiative of the mutually recognized international health code is being accepted by more countries of the world. At the G20 leaders summit last November, Chinese President Xi Jinping called on countries to further harmonize the policies and standards and establish fast tracks to facilitate the orderly flow of personnel. He also proposed a global mechanism on the mutual recognition of health certificates based on nuclear acid test results in the form of internationally accepted QR codes. It is an encapsulation of the experience that China has gained in fighting the virus and is an unassailable affirmation of its commitment to building a global community of health for all. I'm confident that as the pandemic situation eases and with the acceleration of mutual recognition of health certificates, the cross-border movement of people will return to some measure of growth. Traveling with a uniform international QR code will no longer be a dream. After successfully withstanding this latest pandemic, the tourism sector should not simply aim at returning to the old products and revert back to the way things were in the past. Rather, it should assiduously strive to recognize, identify, and meet, if not exceed, people's change expectation and demands for new quality products, services, and experiences. The pandemic has made people more attentive to the safety of tourism products and services. 
thereby raising delivery to a high tourism quality standard. The demand for new experiences is driving an increased focus on tours of city hostels, studying and outdoor tours, for example, while self-driving has become a new way of life. Privacy concerns have also increased and the concept of uh, contactless, personalized, uh, humanist state and niche tourism products and services is becoming increasingly popular. To promote tourism development, we need to redouble our efforts in the following areas. First, enrich the concept of tourism. Tourism companies should not only focus on the application of advanced technologies, but should also put consumers' interests front and center. While making bold innovations, they should likewise contribute to the preservation of cultural heritage and make sincere efforts to promote creative development, brand building, and industrial integration. And second, boost the quality of tourism. Together, we need to pursue high quality tourism with a new and innovative approach to development and leverage the internet plus tourism model to promote the building of intelligent tourism. With regular containment protocols beautifully implemented, we need to push for innovation in tourism production, services, and management. More importantly, we need to enhance tourism products and create more opportunities for sustainable tourism consumption. Third, meet and deliver on people's aspiration for a better life. We should all advocate for civility, courtesy, respect and reverence for local cultures, traditions, natural resources, and landmarks by tourists and locals alike. A diverse portfolio of high quality, safety guaranteed tourism products with targeted designs and hospitality services for different consumer groups must be developed because that is what the future travelers is increasingly expecting. I'm confident that when this COVID 19 pandemic is behind us, the global tourism sector will like the phoenix rising high and tall from the ashes of the past, experience a new period of well-managed and sustainable growth. The World Tourism Alliance joins with the worldwide tourism community in advocating for the responsible and timely reopening and recovery of our industry when the time is right. We join hands with our partners in the international travel and tourism community in promoting sustainable, high-quality tourism development in the post-COVID world, thereby creating a better and happier life for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Very interesting presentation, uh, Demetrius. I think it was very, very, very significant. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Absolutely, and because um, uh, Mr. Liu uh, represents uh, WTA, but also he used to be the director of marketing of China. He understands very, very well how China is going to to develop, and and we all know that China is is um, going to drive the future of tourism. I'm very keen to bring Mario in because. Mario uh, and I, uh, first of all, we're good friends. And I think last time we met was probably about one and a half year ago. And I think we were in Guilin in China, if I remember well. Uh, and and um, I'm, I'm very eager to hear uh, all the good things that Mario has been doing in Pata. And a lot of people know about this, but also his reflection on what we've seen in China, in Europe, and in the world with the uh, WTO. But before uh, Mario um, speaks, uh, Vagelis is going to do a little introduction on Mario. Thank you, Dimitrios. Dr. Mario Hardy is the Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Asia Travel Association since 2014. He has over 30 years of experience in corporate development and investment technology, coupled with several leadership roles with nonprofit organizations. 
Dr. Hardy was appointed CEO of PATA in November 2014 and is also the past chairman of the Board of Trustees of the PATA Foundation, a non-profit organization with a focus on the protection of the environment, the conservation of culture and heritage, and support for education. He has 30 years of experience in specialized aviation businesses, focusing on data analytics and technology, coupled with several corporate leadership capacities. He's also the founder of venture capital firm MAP2 Ventures, an investment fund with a wide portfolio of technology-centric businesses in the field of fintech, artificial intelligence, machine learning, green tech, and FMCG, as well as a platform that provides valuable management advice, mentoring, and access to a vast network built in corporate development. He received an honorary doctorate of letters from Capilano University in 2016 for his philanthropic work in Cambodia, where he helped develop a school for underprivileged children and for his support in the development of a community-based tourism project in Vietnam. Dimitrios. Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with, back with you, Dimitrios. Um, uh, sadly, not in person, but at least uh, virtually. And I uh, like your background. Uh, it gives us good inspiration about places to visit when we can. <laughs> Come to <laughs> that's the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, that's the important word, when we can. And so it's been really interesting to hear about the previous presentations from, from China, from Eduardo, from Alessandra. Um, and, uh, and you know, for, for us who live in Southeast Asia here, we were only dreaming of traveling. And then, so there's a huge difference between what's happening here in Southeast Asia and, and part of North Asia in comparison to the situation in Europe or North America. So most of our borders, uh, actually all of our borders, are currently closed. Uh, it is not possible for us to travel. If I leave Thailand today, I cannot return home. So traveling is only a dream for most of us and will continue to be for uh, likely several months until next year. And so, um, as I said, the situation couldn't be uh, more different than what we're hearing in Europe and other places around the world. Now, there's a reason for this. Um, and, I, and recently at the Arabian travel market where I was speaking, we, we shared the views that you know, we made a comparison of the West versus the East. And, and, and certainly from our perspective, what we've experienced and seen is that for the West has prioritized the economic uh, health of the countries and destinations where the East has uh, actually focused on the health of its citizens and residents first. Now I'm referring back to 15 months ago or a year ago. Um, but obviously in that time, things have changed very much. We're actually at the moment, the approach in Europe appears to be a lot more balanced as what Eduardo was actually sharing before. Uh, vaccination is being accelerated in, in, in Europe and other places around the world at a much faster rate than it is here in Asia. Here in Thailand, less than 0.001% of the population have been vaccinated yet. And for many countries around uh, Asia, uh, it is also in, in, a one, in a single digit uh, numbers in terms of vaccination. So it is very different. However, our economies have suffered enormously, uh, specifically here in Thailand, where the country relies very much on the tourism economy. Many thousands of businesses have closed and have closed permanently with no intentions of reopening. Um, have moved to other sectors or other industries. The most challenging part of this current crisis, in my opinion, as opposed to any other type of crisis we faced in the past. In my seven years leading PATA, uh, sadly, I had, we had to face many other challenges, natural disasters, political instability, um, and many, many more. And they were challenging at a time that I actually they lasted for a fixed period of time three months, maybe six months at the maximum. That was probably the longest impact we had. This situation is different, not only because it is actually longer, but also because it's uneven. It keeps changing. It changes very frequently. There's a lot of uncertainty. So 
there's no better place or no better time now to actually use the terminology VUCA, the VUCA world um, is extremely appropriate in this current situation because it's extremely volatile, it's very uncertain, it keeps changing. The recovery is what we're all anticipating. Everyone, uh, I'm sure all of you, and certainly myself, have been asked countless amount of time, almost per day, when are we gonna restart? When will our border reopen? It is nearly impossible to forecast and answer that question with precision. And the reason for this is because it keeps shifting by the day. You wake up one morning and everything looks actually very promising. You wake up and you smile all day saying, yes, we're moving in the right direction. And the next morning, things going the opposite direction. We've all heard about the bubble, Singapore, Hong Kong. I actually stopped counting how many times it was announced that the Singapore, Hong Kong bubble would actually be starting. I can't even imagine how many people have actually purchased ticket for the bubble who are now actually sitting on it and waiting for that bubble to reopen. As you probably know, that bubble just got canceled uh, just a few days ago again. And that's the level of uncertainty we're living in. So the challenge is how do we regain the confidence of the travelers moving forward? First, what people are interested in is they want, to, they want to ensure that where they're going to travel to is safe. And it has good health protocols in place, that it is a, the number of cases at the destinations are well under control. And then the second, they also want to know about how do I get there? What are the protocols for me to travel out of my country and entering this other destination and for me to return home? And the fact that I actually change it frequently actually makes it really challenging for me to decide as to where I can go. That's the other aspect of it is where can you go? Because at the moment, many destinations, yes, I may be allowed to actually leave the UK. And Australia is on that list of, 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 people, of places I can travel, but Australia is closed. So I can't travel to Australia if I live in the UK at the moment, even though it's actually on the acceptable list. And you review every single destination and actually it's, the situation is different. And then the third aspect is the sentiment, the confidence of traveling and knowing that actually your flight isn't gonna be canceled or that actually even worse, you get to your destination and the borders close and you can't go home. You're stuck at the destination. So when we talk about restart and recovery, if you consider all of these factors, the recovery is gonna be long, painful, and slow, uneven, for all of these reasons. And there is one more, one more reason where actually it's gonna be challenging too. We heard from Chris before, the airlines have been in, impacted severely, either financially or in many other ways. And the route accessibility, the air access to destinations around the world, is a lot less frequent than it was before. Direct service to many destinations are non-existent anymore. Even connecting to certain destination would actually take you not actually hours, but now possibly days before you actually reach that other destinations. You have countries in the Pacific, which Pata represent, island nations who are heavily dependent on tourism who now currently have no air access at all, zero. It's going back into centuries where actually things get shipped by ships as opposed to flights. Uh, there are cargo flights in some destination, but still it's a challenge. So- Mario, you're, you're kind of confirming the war scenario that I was talking about early on, right? Yes. It's only yeah, a that, war scenario. That's the worst scenario. Now things can shift. And that's why I was saying earlier is that actually it's unpredictable. So the worst case scenario is what we're looking at at the moment. But as I mentioned, our perspective here in Asia is very different from what we're actually hearing in the media in terms of what's happening in Europe and other places because of the current situation now where we have uh, clusters re reoccurring in many destinations here in Thailand and in Singapore uh, and Chinese Taipei and other places across the region here. Um, 
Now at Pata, and I'll, I'll conclude on, on, on that area, is as you know, Demetrios, we, we publish a forecast every year. Um, and we've just released our, our revised numbers just a few days ago. Well, of course, we don't really refer it as a forecast anymore because it's practically impossible to predict. However, what we have done is we have looked at scenarios, worst case scenarios, mid-tier scenarios, and of course, the best case scenarios and over a three-year period. Now, what it was interesting to me when the professors who were, who were working with at Hong Kong PoliU and the other experts who worked on, on these scenarios, uh, when they shared with us a few days ago their, uh, their results, it was pretty much in line with what it was actually was predicted back in January with a small percentage point uh, and a positive side, actually improving in some areas, which is good, uh, but not significantly in, in, in marginal. And we were looking specifically here at the Asia region, um, looking at you know, pretty bad numbers in terms of, of you know, the severe scenario, mostly for 2021, uh, because again, considering that borders are closed. However, more optimistic, when it comes to 2022, and of course, much more optimistic for 2023. But still, by 2023, it will still would not be at the same level it was pre-COVID-19. And I think you, Dimitrios, and many others on this call probably heard this many times from UNWTO, from WTTC, as well as PATA, that we do not expect a full recovery and when I say full recovery, let me you know, highlight the point that actually I'm making is on a global basis, to be pre the site, to see the main level before pre COVID 19 until 2024 and possibly longer. But let me also again point out the fact that, as I mentioned, uneven, meaning that certain countries and certain destinations around the world will actually do far, far, far better, will be ahead of that by far. But equally, there will be others who will be lagging behind, which will actually take possibly much longer than 2024 to get to the same level we were before. And a lot of it is in relation to rate of vaccination, the success of the vaccination, the effectiveness of that vaccination, as well as the health protocols that will be put in place to ensure the health and safety. And of course, all the other elements we've mentioned before, air accessibility and the sentiment and the confidence of the travelers. Um, but you know, the important thing here to, to finish on a positive point is the fact that the, all surveys have been conducted by ourselves and other organization shows that the desire to travel is extremely strong. And as you heard just previously also in regards to China, if you look at the number of travelers in the last holiday, May holiday, which is just a few weeks ago, it was over 280 or 230 million people have traveled during that period of time domestically. Now, imagine if the Chinese borders were open and were able to welcome them, would be flooded by actually tourists, which is all that the destinations wish for. So there is a glimpse of hope moving forward because people do have the desire to travel. And we do anticipate they will, as we've talked about revenge travel. And, uh, but it may actually be progressive because of the slow reopening of and the recoveries. So I, I hope I actually didn't, didn't give too much of a negative or, or, or pessimistic views to everyone, but I'd like to be more of a realist in, 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 the, in, the, in the sense of what is happening around me here in Asia. Absolutely, Mario, and, and that's why I kept you at the end of the uh, policymakers, because, <laughs> because exactly you encapsulated what's happening. I think one of the critical aspects is how much citizens follow government advice. And what we see in China and in Asia in general, people follow their governments. And the governments in Asia, they've been quite strict as far as, because they followed with exactly what you said, the, the health priority. And that's why you see countries like Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, you know, um, China, Hong Kong, and all the, all the region, having managed much better uh, while the UK we lost 130,000 people and you know uh, the US uh, half a million people and, and things like that. And something else yeah. that's happening now in the UK is 
You remember when I introduced the, the term kamikaze travel, people who will travel under any circumstances. Now it is coming back and there's a lot of pressure on governments to actually open up and move forward and just uh, do that. While in Asia, you don't have this pressure. Uh, the political pressure is not there. The, gov- the people follow what the government say and they follow the recommendations and the protocols and they are patient waiting uh, until these things mm-hmm. happen. I think the, the important point here that you're making, Dimitrios, is actually that uh, in all countries around Asia here, the decisions to open borders or to allow people to travel, even domestically or regionally, is actually made by the health ministries and not by the tourism ministries. And so in every meeting that we've had with uh, tourism ministers over the last few months, there was always, always someone from the health ministry in that meeting who would actually voice their opinion in regards to Uh, the process to move forward. And so that, that's the main difference, I suppose, to maybe other places around the world is that the health ministry has occupied a very, very important part in the decisions. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mario. Would you be able to stay with thank us for, for a while? Um, I will. I'll be around. Uh, thank you. We may, we may have a, a, a more conversation at the end. So that com- completes sure. the policy uh, session of the panel. And now we are going into the analyst and the futurist and some great friends who have got great numbers to show us what's happening. I can see Steve is ready to go. Uh, we've got Luca uh, Ramonzi as well. And we've got Alexander uh, Goranson from Euromonitor. And my good friend, uh, Chu Long Lee, who is waiting patiently in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur and it's quite getting quite late, but uh, I'll keep him last because I would ask him to do a similar thing with, with Mario to kind of uh, see uh, the global world how it's going. Should we start with Steve? And, and I know that we're running a little bit over time and I hope that you are going to be able to be with us. Is there anybody of you gentlemen that is in a great rush? You've got to go somewhere else or would you be able to go for the next hour or so? Okay, yeah, we're good to go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, um, Vangelis, why don't you introduce Steve to begin with, and then we're going to go to Luca and then to Alexander, because Steve and Luca are going to bring us more numbers, and I'm sure that Alexander will bring more analysis to it. Well, Steve is senior uh, vice president of uh, research in STR. Uh, he has been with STR for 25 years and was involved in the original development of the STAR program, utilized by nearly 70,000 hotels all over the world and almost all hotel companies. Steve is the founding director of the SARE Center, STR's program to support hospitality and tourism education with over 1,000 schools involved from 80 different countries. The STR SARE Center provides hospitality and tourism data for research and for use in the classroom as well as related resources, including student certifications, training programs and student competitions. Steve serves on advisory boards and as an honorary professor for leading schools, including Cornell, Penn State, Virginia Tech, University of Delaware, Colorado State, Ecole Hôtelière de Lausanne, and Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Steve has been recognized by the International Cree Industry Recognition Award, the Eurocreen Estelle Progastronomia Award, and I have to uh, sincerely thank him uh, for uh, supporting so much Uh, strongly and really passionately Eurocree during the last 20 years. And he has also been um, recognized by the hotel schools of distinction for his commitment to hospitality and tourism education. Well, Demetrius and Steve. Steve, the floor is yours. I know that you've got fantastic data and statistics to share with us. Um, please, please go ahead. Hey, it's great to be with you, and sorry uh, you didn't have a uh, shorter bio than that. I'm going to go ahead and share share my screen, and uh, perfect. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. 
Um, and what I'd like to do is just uh, catch up a little bit uh, of what's going, what's happened in the history, and then looking forward as as well. So uh, both perspectives, and and really, I think catch up with uh, some of what Mario shared and somewhat uh, several of the speakers have shared so far. Um, I, I think everybody understands STR collects data from all hotels all over the world, close to seventy thousand hotels. So the data that we're getting is dynamic data from just last week, all over the world, all the major chains participate. And for those of you who are academics in the audience, we make this data available to academics for free for academic research, use in the classroom, student projects. So anything that I'm sharing with you, you have the ability, academics, you have the ability to obtain this data and, and, and use it for research. And, and Talk about the number of research opportunities, lots of opportunities is, uh, in, in the current situation that we're at. Obviously, one of the big stories is the hotel closures. This shows you uh, we've we've tracked that over. To, we, you know, that was not something we tracked. There are a lot of things we're doing now that we weren't doing a year and a half ago, uh, but hotel closures, tracking them very carefully is one of those things. Most of those have reopened over time. No surprise here, 2020 was the worst year in the history of the hotel industry. This sh shows you total year occupancies, 2020 compared to 2019. So look at Europe, total year occupancy in Europe was 33%, 2019 was 72. In Asia PAC, 39 compared to 72. So you know, we, uh, the industry has never seen numbers like this before. Now, when we jump ahead to Q1, let's just look at Q1 a little bit for these same regions. Here we see mixed results. Now, certain areas like North America and Mideast and Australia and Oceania had better results in Q1 of 2021 compared to 2020, but other areas did not. Look at Europe. Europe went down, uh, no surprise, second you know, major second downturn there, 23 compared to 33. Even China, 46 compared to 49. So mixed results in Q1. This just shows it to you uh, for, for the major gateway cities all over the world. Now, I didn't give you the 2020 results, but I did give you the 2021 results, uh, uh, Q1 results. In Q1, interestingly enough, you saw more green cities. Now, the what I'm uh, tracking here, what I'm showing here is occupancy and then the, the different colors, red is occupancies below 25, green are occupancies above 50 and yellow is in between. In Q1, we saw more red and more green. Q1, look at Europe, for example, London, Berlin, Paris, Rome, all below 25. So you know, mixed results in Q1, some areas moving up, some areas moving down. Now, this chart shows line graphs of the major regions during the entire uh, history of COVID, where from, from February, where you see China at the very bottom below 10%. And then, you know, as we were talking, as several of the speakers have mentioned, China had very strong recovery up until October, November, the, the Golden Week holiday. Actually, there were days during that holiday that surpassed 2019. Of course, then a second wave beginning. But look, you know, good recovery back up to uh, back up to 70 percent. You see other areas experiencing similar situations. Uh, U.S. back up to close to 60 percent and, and different areas. Europe, you know, seeing some increase uh, most recently. And this is just data from two weeks ago. So, uh, again, you know, we're seeing some positive signs here. Diversity has really been the 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 key word, when you look at Asia PAC, look at the diversity here, um, all kinds of different things from, you know, you see China, you see the China graph in there again, you see Australia, very consistent recovery, a good promotion of domestic tourism. Look at Maldives, where they turn the uh, uh, turn travel back on at the end of the year, went up to 80% for the holidays in, in Maldives, uh, attracted a lot of attention. But then, of course, you see Thailand and Vietnam, as Mario was saying, you know, really hurting and, and really still close to the bottom. You, you look at Europe, big diversity here. You see, uh, you know, you see sample countries in Europe. You see some of them coming out of here, The you know, Russia being pretty strong in, in 2021. UK coming back as well. And, and uh, we'll look ahead in just a minute, because obviously, you know, we've, we're hearing a lot of 
no, uh, news from from Europe, you know, planning reopening for the summer and, and positive signs for sure. One of the things that STR tracks is STR tracks forward looking data. The data I've shown you up to this point has all been historic. But we also track reservation business on the book. So look at what happened, you know, related to May 17. That was just last Monday. Look at the business on the books, how that surged. Now, this is going back a week, looking at reservation data, and you see a big surge, you know, after uh, after uh, restrictions were lifted. You know, the first and a lot of this is related to weekends. And, and that's, of course, a big story, the weekend getaways here. And and look at how reservations jumped up uh, immediately. Uh, a country like uh, Ireland, shortly behind, you know, they're counting. And I, I'm not sure if the the, you know, announcements have have. Uh, specifically been made, but they're counting on being open two or three weeks right after the UK. And again, you see the reservations jump up there. Of course, they, they have a big uh, sporting event coming up in June and July. Here's uh, forward-looking data for uh, the rest of the, a lot of the other countries in Europe, and, and you see some strong results. You see uh, Netherlands and Switzerland jumping up dramatically and positive news coming from Switzerland right now where uh, restaurants are back open and even Spain, you know, if, and, and look at Spain, very hard hit uh, during 2020. And you see some some jump there more than France and Belgium and Italy. Again, this type of data is available if you're interested. And, and when we look ahead in Europe, look at look at the events that you see these big spikes in some of these big cities are major events and we see you know positive reservation data and and that's great news notice they start in june july and then throughout the fall we're seeing positive signs here related to big events great to see that now when it comes to recovery we have to understand that's going to be different by different types of business and different types of travel right now you, you'll see the progressions there from leisure to business to events and groups from domestic to international just like the speakers have been saying up to this point um, this is interesting. Not all destinations are created equal. Look at uh, especially the leisure markets. We're seeing a lot of these, you know, strength in a lot of these leisure markets and some actually outperform. Sanya, for example, the, the 2020 numbers actually outperformed 2019. So here's a hot resort destination that that beat their prior year records in the midst of a pandemic. I give you lots of other leisure examples, Maldives, Darwin, Sochi, Algarve, the ski resorts in Swiss, Switzerland, nice when you're the only resorts that are open, all kinds of different leisure markets that actually did better or did well comparatively in 2020 compared to the prior year. Lots of lessons to learn here, lots of research opportunities. This was interesting because look at the surge in occupancy in Israel with, with the vaccines uh, related to the, the vaccines being rolled out in March and April, big surge there, very positive. We're seeing positive numbers from the U.S. Um, spring break was very positive. And honestly, we thought that was going to go back down, but no, it actually stayed up for nine records uh, for nine weeks, uh, up close to 60%, has not surpassed 60%. Uh, everybody's looking ahead to Memorial Day. That'll be two weeks, and and uh, and and that'll be the start of summer for the U.S. So again, these weeks have been record since March of 2020. You know, some positive news. Positive news from Dubai. Look at how that's uh, how Dubai has come back, and a lot of that has been the business traveler, which is very uh, good to see. Remember the progression from leisure to business. Interesting signs in China just recently. In, in the beginning of the year, we're seeing the tier one markets come back uh, to, uh, strong. Now, that had not been the case in 2020. We're seeing tier one, the tier one cities are coming back in the beginning of the year. We're seeing the higher end hotels coming back, and that had not been the case in 2020. So we're seeing a shift in the in, in the business here, which bodes very well for the future. Uh, 
small events we see coming back around the world. This is just one example in India uh, at the be- at the beginning of the year as well. And and this was that big surge uh, that you, that I showed you before in Glasgow, the UN Climate Change Conference, ninety percent booked. Now, obviously, Glasgow is a small city, so if you want a room there, you know you gotta you gotta book ahead. But you know this is an event in November. And a city in Europe, 90% booked and even overflowing into Edinburgh. Edinburgh is about 40% or 50% booked for that time. So as Mario said, recovery is going to be different in different areas of the world. It's, you know, we're projecting out, you know, and, and keep in mind, recovery it has various metrics. You have demand, the room sold, occupancy, average daily rate, rev bar, all those things have to come back. But it's going to be different in different areas. Some areas are going to bounce bounce back much quicker. Areas like Thailand, as Mario was saying, that's going to take that's going to take more time. And uh, but we're looking at positive signs 2022, 2023 when we're getting back to 2019 records. That's just a quick look at data. And uh, please let us know if we can help you research opportunities. We'd love to explore more with you all. And if you uh, if you'd like more information, here's how to get in touch with me. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, incredible information and and uh, a whole range of data there that will make sure that we we take the right decisions on our way forward, learning from what was ha- has happened. Thank you. Uh, let's bring Luca in because he also has got numbers and then we'll bring Alexander to actually show us some more qualitative uh, in, insights uh, to, to complete the conversation. Uh, Vagelis, would you like to introduce uh, my friend Luca? Yes, of course. Luca Romozzi is Sojourn's Senior Director leading the team dedicated to partnerships with destination marketing organizations all over Europe. He has almost 14 years of experience in travel, tech, and destination marketing. Before joining Sojourn, Lucas spent nearly a decade expanding the Expedia media solutions teams in EMEA cross-travel verticals. Luca completed a master's in tourism economics and management at Foscari University in Venice, Italy. Dimitrios, Luca. Dimitrios, Luca. Luca, I think you've got fantastic information uh, from your data, and we really look forward to uh, to see your insights. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, do you see my screen? I tried to share immediately. Um, well, of course, thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you, Angelis. Thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me. It's really a big honor. And also, it probably is my happiest week because I got vaccinated and I booked my first business trip. So <laughs> it's, a, it's perfect on time. Um, so I, I'm going to take you through uh, some ideas, okay, that we can be just key starters to then have a discussion later. What I want to make sure is that for who doesn't know us, uh, Sojourn is responsible for digital marketing and we do through data. So we are very different on uh, uh, from SDR, of course. So we are more a, a, a digital marketing platform. So for who doesn't know uh, what we do with the platform, we empower travel marketers to move travelers from dreaming to destination. And we do that thanks to real-time data and AI technologies. So to make sure that our clients, the 10,000 clients are happy as those travelers are back into the Greek sea, um, we need data, okay? We need lots of data and we need it real time. So the data that we we do receive to empower our marketing campaigns are coming from 100 data partners, hotels, airlines, OTA, Meta, Rail, Cruise and so on. So today, what you need to think in mind, have in mind <clears throat> is that the data I'm going to share is basically coming from an aggregation of those partners. And of course, is uh, coming from their website. So have in mind probably an FIT traveler, okay, so more independent, and of course, online. It's coming from uh, consumers that are uh, mainly online. So first of all, actually, I uh, definitely encourage everyone 
to go on our site. Uh, we launched during the pandemic a open data dashboard. You can consult. Uh, it, it shows the volume and the forward looking. So it's very interesting and is open to the whole industry. Just log in and you can play with it. It uh, uh, drills down until city. And so here, we're well, gonna take you through my 55 slides. No, there are only five, don't worry, <laughs> Dimitri, uh, on uh, the world travel insights, and then we'll focus on Europe and, uh, and, and Greece. So let's start with a check-in, okay? So what you have here is the trends of the travel intent. So the searches that we see on hotels and flights compared to January 2020. So we didn't know what was happening. And you can see that we're still a minus 47% on hotels and still a minus 32% on compared to January. Now, the interesting part there is we are obviously on the highest, like the flight intent you see it has never been so high during the uh, past uh, effectively year and a half. Now, the interesting part is that when we move to confidence on the booking, actually those um, uh, um, figures, again, this is global, so it's more, uh, there are some regions that are growing, some that are losing. However, what is interesting to notice is that actually some of the bookings uh, are growing even faster. Is because when it, we, we notice more and more that uh, there is a little bit less dreaming and some people are starting to book. So that's why we see an acceleration. Again, check in, of course, we are still negative compared to um, January 2020. So minus 23 on hotels booking and minus 32 on flight booking since the first week of 2020. When we go to Europe, you can see that is a little bit negative, more negative. So of course, think about from a global, there are someone that is pushing fast and, and the Europe is in the middle. And of course, Asia is, if we would have had the Asian one, is on the latter part, but you can see how they change. So here you can see that uh, um, bookings to Europe, so those ones are to European destination, it's minus 67% on hotels and minus 37%. Now, the positive part that you can see that anyway, the last weeks, they're all on the surge. So that's something to notice. Now for my Greek friends, I'm happy to, to share that actually, you can see that when you look at Greece only, the uh, Greece as a the, the destination is actually on the upper part of the growth compared to Europe. And uh, obviously we're getting to the, to the summer, obviously there are positive messages in, in the media more and more. So this is obviously uh, uh, pushing, but you can see that here we're talking about confidence because we're talking about bookings. I know that can be flexible, and there's a bit discussion regard, regarding how is going to be the impact of uh, potential cancellation. So that's important to know. But this is the booking that we see to, to Greece. And we see actually a minus 15% compared to uh, January and a minus 4% compared to what it used to be in, uh, in the January 2020. So again, huge surge from effectively the past two months. On this slide, I uh, want to show you instead the trend looking only at 2021. So here we're starting from uh, the, the um, index of the first week of 2021. And on the left, you can see the total EMEA, so in European, Middle East and African um, destination, how was uh, with an index of the first week of um, January, how was the trend? You can see that obviously there's been some turbulence on the, uh, uh, on the bookings, of course, but then from the end of March, so after Easter effectively, after the European uh, Catholic Easter, you can see that uh, there is a continuous trend positive and, uh, and now we are 47% for what it used to be the bookings for a motel. On the right, I put just a quick screenshot on some of the Mediterranean uh, destination. And you can see there are huge growth pretty much uh, everywhere. Obviously here, uh, we need to also consider the size. So for Spain, Italy to grow as much as uh, other, the destination is obviously harder. 
but it gives a trend. It gives a trend that we see that Mediterranean destination, they're growing faster than any EMEA destination. Uh, certainly, uh, thanks to the summer season uh, uh, up, that is coming. One that is standing apart is actually Turkey. And uh, again, there are high measure of lockdown and you can see that actually is immediately impacted. So if you would have seen those uh, destination with higher measure, of course, it would have had a different uh, outlook. But for the Mediterranean friends, I would say that definitely we see a, a huge uh, positive uh, growth. So again, we go back to hotel to Greece, okay? An uh, interesting part, it, and I think it will be more and more important, is the market share. Because corridors, permission, communication will change a little bit how your new travelers will be. So it's interesting to look, and what we what uh, we did, we look back a very short window, so the last 15 days, to be honest, and the last 15 days we saw what are the changes uh, for bookings to Greece. And we saw that compared to last year, actually France and Germany are becoming more and more important for the hoteliers in, uh, uh, in Greece. And so that's an important thing. So remember that some travelers will change some origin market will definitely change. Now we go on flight to Greece. And you can see from the uh, graph, you have three lines. One is the year of a year of 2019. Then is the year of a year of 2020. I don't know if you see the gray line. You can see we ended up at you know, minus 80%. And then 2021, as you can see, from April, we definitely see a surge that uh, uh, received to Greece. And that's, you know, from a, a flight booking point of view, it's very encourages, encouraging because at the moment, we are at the level, what we see on our data partners, we see at the level of 2019. Obviously, this is only to uh, Greece. So it's a um, very encouraging sign for the summer. And the last slide, that I want to share is a look forward, okay? So look forward into the future. These ones we're talking about um, what I, uh, Americans, British, French, Italians, look forward uh, search. So those ones are um, the bookings, of, uh, sorry, the hotels booking that have been made the last 30 days. So in the mid-May to mid-April, uh, with a departure that you can see on the screen. So from April, May, June, up to April, 2022. So we'd like to close with a positive note because if we look at the last 30 days on the booking, we can see that obviously they are very green. Again, we need to take into consideration that there are different markets that will, will definitely have a different impact. However, I want to, I love to, to close in an optimistic uh, uh, side where, you can see that all the departure dates are actually green with strong um, um, re um, growth. With the difference of France and Italy that they have some on the future looking. So what is interesting again is to say like the confidence at least from uh, countries like Europe and also the US is actually definitely coming uh, back. Last four things like for the discussion, I think, I loved one article that uh, uh, Demetrius posted at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was about bracing, okay? Brace because we need to be confident and, and land. I think right now we landed and we need to be ready to challenge ourselves. And we need to be challenged in four areas that are important. One, data-driven, it's, it's something that it's crucial being data-driven, but it cannot be overnight something that it's a continuous process. So the know-how is fundamental, but it's not just buying, uh, a, 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 just doing one once. Second, the KPIs must change on any destinations. And the KPI must change with a centric, uh, customer-centric view. Then data and technology must be part of a, uh, the strategy because the travelers are gonna 
will always be online, will always be everywhere, and will be always multi-channel. So if you don't have data and technology that are working together, it's going to be really, really hard to understand how to have a consumer-centric view. Finally, public and private partnership. It's time for tourism to uh, push this area. UNAN WTO put it as a goal before 2020, and it's important that there needs to be a um, push as an industry to have this collaboration flourishing for an industry that uh, it's obviously transversal and is not definitely vertical for many economies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, fantastic data and great to see some optimism. And that confirms uh, what we've been saying is that people are uh, ready to travel and they're engaging uh, in, in all kinds of activities. I'm a little bit concerned, and I've got to share it with you. Um, and this is something that we now see where people are doing double bookings and triple bookings. And because of the cancellation policies being quite flexible, I think what we'll see is a lot of bookings and, and actually even a booking is not a conversion as far as it's concerned. It's, it's the, the, the minute that someone steps on an airplane and they start going on a trip that, that we should count. But, 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 but the trends are quite, uh, uh, quite significant that we will be traveling. Um, let's go to Alexander and then have a conversation together with, with Lee as well. Alexander. Yeah. Rather, rather let, let Evangelos actually introduce you and then you're speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Demetrius. Thank you, Alexander. Alexander Gerenson. I hope I'm Gerenson. Gerenson. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> is a consultant at Euromonitor International with a great interest in the travel industry. Alexander works very closely with Euromonitor's network of in-country analysts, in-country analysts to gain an understanding, an understanding of the key trends affecting consumer markets across Western Europe, which he uses to make estimations for market sizes and shares and forecasts. Alexander has been in Euromonitor for 19 years and we're really looking forward to some, some really impressive data. Alexander, Dimitrios. Yeah, thank, um, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Evangelos. And I'd like to say it's a great pleasure to be here with a very distinguished panel and audience and many very interesting presentations. So I've put together a presentation. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Um, and we need to go into full screen mode. Um, is it um, showing correctly? Great, so I'm um, good to go then. So um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, restarting the global tourism industry and Euromonitor's thoughts about that. And we'll first be looking at our latest forecast outlook, and then we'll be moving on to look at the softer consumer drivers, which we, see, we expect will drive the recovery. And for those of you not familiar with Euromonitor International, we're an international business intelligence company. We cover a wide range of consumer industries. My focus is on the travel side of things. And as Evangelos mentioned, we work with a network of local analysts. Where we differ to perhaps what STR are doing in Sojourn is that we are more focused on tactical research as to plan future business decisions. So um, to begin with, looking at our latest forecast outlook. So before I move on to that, just want to say that really, and it's been discussed a lot in the previous um, uh, presenters as well, that consumer confidence, what we see is going to be the key to recovery. As you all know, there's a tremendous amount of pent up demand out there. But to overcome that and to get people traveling, again, the biggest barrier is not so much financial or concern about the coronavirus. It's just the fact that, you know, what are the travel restrictions when you go to a destination? Will you be let in? Will there be things to do? Uh, and of course, the big risk of, you know, if I travel somewhere, will I get stuck in transport? Will I not be able to come home? Or 
will I have to quarantine, quarantine when I come home? So what is important here and to sort of enable the travel industry to recover is going to be to coordinate travel restrictions. As we heard earlier on, there's been a good move on that by the European Commission. Again, vaccine passports, will they be recognised everywhere? That needs to be coordinated. And at the same time, from the industry side, um, we mentioned cancellation policies earlier. That is going to be key, as we'll see later on, is one of the main things that consumers look at when booking travel. And equally, hotels, for example, and other venues will need to coordinate hygiene protocols to instill consumer confidence. Um, and the way we work at Euromonitor is we've developed uh, a travel forecast model. Uh, and this is based mainly on econometrics, but we also include soft drivers by destination. We have then, such as connectivity, for example, we have now also in response to the global pandemic, we have built in functionality here by looking at, for example, the level of vaccination in different markets. Um, and when we expect herd immunity to happen, and it then allows you to play with a number of scenarios, both tourism in general, but also COVID specific. But to simplify our tool, I've put together a graph showing our current forecast scenarios. So this is global um, tourism spending at a global level. And as you're all well aware, 2020 saw a massive decline in tourism, effectively the whole industry ground to a halt. And we had a 74% decline in inbound spending on a global level. And we've got three, um, four scenarios here, the baseline being in blue. And they vary a bit. I'll just talk about the um, top and bottom ones. So the optimistic scenario that with less than a 10% probability will go with that, but it, um, it, it estimates that social distancing will be with us for at least another further quarter, possibly until the end of the year. And therefore we won't see herd immunity beginning to build up until quarter three, quarter four. So that will in turn affect on when governments release travel restrictions. The pessimistic scenario which is in, in uh, yellow, that will continue with travel restrictions. We won't begin to see vaccinations and herd immunity into well into 2022. But what I think is very important to consider here is, and as previous speakers have mentioned, there's a pent up demand. So the market will recover. The big question is at what rate and how soon? And a lot of that will depend on the prerequisites I mentioned, I showed in the previous slide to do with coordination with travel legislations, vaccine rollouts. Um, but again, I think what's key in this chart is that we are expect, if you look at all these patterns, the start may vary, but they all begin to converge around 2025. In terms of volume, we are expecting to be back at 2019 levels around 24, 25, but the value recovery will be slower. So that we are forecasting now at seven plus years at present. And in terms of which destinations will prosper, the chart here shows um, inbound receipts for 2019 pre-crisis level 2020 and 2025 which is in yellow and we've got a large Greek audience here and you'll be pleased to see that we are forecasting for Greece to actually have one of the fastest recoveries I think it's only Turkey that's going to be recovering quicker here of these selected European markets where indeed by 2025 we expect Greece to be 12% um, uh, higher than 2019 levels. And this ties in a lot with what um, Luca was showing just now, how Greece is you know, very much in demand for, for searches. And that again is due to Greece has been acting very quickly in terms of 
opening up uh, the borders and making it possible to travel. Also, Greece has a lot going for it in the current environment, as we'll see in later slides. There's going to be a shift towards more away from bigger cities to more rural destinations. But Greece has an advantage, lots of different islands to travel to, so the tourists can spread out. And that actually, Greece matches very well the current market climate. Um, the countries which are going to be recovering slower based on our baseline forecast are going to be Spain and France. Reasons there are they have a higher proportion, especially France, of travel to bigger cities, which is not in demand at the moment. They also have a higher exposure to meetings, incentives and conferences, which again, the whole business travel and the meeting sector we forecast to be amongst the slowest to recover. So moving on to what Euromonitor see as the main drivers driving this recovery from a consumer perspective. So at the moment, domestic tourism has in boom is maybe too strong a word, but in the immediate term, we're talking 2021, 22, it's domestic travel, which is holding up the tourism industry at the moment. So people can't travel abroad, but they're instead discovering destinations closer to home. And indeed, it, based on our, our surveys, we are seeing that 83% of global travelers plan to travel more, word is here, closer to home in the coming years. And domestic travel used, tends to relate to rural, so visiting more destinations in the countryside. And this does, goes back to the next step of the agenda in the UK. There's an oft quoted expression by politicians, which is to build back better. So to offer more sustainable travel solutions, which again, tend to be away from the bigger cities. But we should not overlook that the consumers are very much you know, concerned about flexible booking. They want to be able to cancel, not risk losing their travel in the event of some kind of a change in the situation, which again, when we look at the COVID, COVID recovery and travel restrictions, we are still in a very fluid situation. So um, Euromonitor Commission surveys and consumer surveys on, um, on expectations in travel and, and other goods and services. And we have a very large panel. Um, it's 40,000 respondents across 40 markets worldwide. And we use these to underpin our forecasts. But as the chart shows here, um, in terms of the preferences, global consumer preferences for travel and what people will be prioritizing in 2020 and 21. Relaxation is always a perennial driver of tourism of interest, but what is very strong at the moment is nature and outdoor tourism, as well as um, in immersion into the local culture. So again, nature, sustainability, However, what is out of fashion at meeting at the moment in 20 and 21 is going to be visits to cities and arts and, herit and, arts and heritage. And another one that we have looked at, and here's actually a bit of a sort of a mixed look actually, but it's the consumer interest in sustainable travel and the consumer interest in mass market travel, which perhaps are a bit contradictory. But what we can see is that sustainable is actually of interest to a very large consumer group. 48% of consumers would have expressed an interest in sustainable travel. If we look at the markets where sustainable travel is most important, and if we look now at the this is now by destination, so the source markets who request destination national travel, they include where sustainable is bigger than the mass option, actually a number of inbound of key inbound markets for Greece, such as France, Germany, and Italy. Um, so yes. And uh, also at Euromonitor, we have put together a global sustainability index where we rank mark where we rank destinations 
by their sustainability. And I thought I'd share with you here the highlights of uh, for um, the southeast southeastern Europe, the Balkan region. As we can see, Greece ranks 32 globally, still in the top third, and very highly on sustainable transport. A nearby market which is doing very well is also Croatia. Now, our Global Sustainability Index, it ranks 99 markets globally based on a total of 57 parameters based on destination factors such as the quality of life to more environmental factors such as sustainability of transport and travel and lodging in destination. And finally, to emphasize here with the importance of flexible booking, and it was mentioned by earlier by a speaker that a lot of booking at the moment is actually using vouchers from previous cancelled bookings. But in terms of who is requesting flexible booking here for the selected markets in the slide, for example, free cancellation is an influential factor for 50 and to more travellers in most of the markets and much more ahead than flexible payment, payment terms or even free upgrades. So to summarise what will be the factors to enable the, the global travel industry to recover, the key one, absolutely more than anything, is going to be improved coordination of travel restrictions by governments. And when that's done, the line chart I showed you earlier, we begin to see the upward curves as soon as that's done. Um, the industry will need to supply flexible booking terms and conditions. At the same time, the industry will need to res respond to people now altering their, altering their travel preferences from cities to rural destinations. And again, we'll need to factor in sustainability as this becomes more of the mind of consumers. But above all, tourism will recover. So thank you very much for listening. You've got my contact details on screen. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you, thank you. That was very interesting. Hmm? Was Agelis, very interesting. I, I guess there are several questions and I think you may like to ask our friends who are bringing uh, uh, real research you know, uh, Steve, Luca, and Alexander together. Um, you, we can we can ask them a couple of questions, and then we're going to go to Mr. Lee and conclude the session together. Yes. Uh, well, th there are lots of questions. Of course, it's impossible to convey all of them, but um, I try to I try to find out what is the uh, well the, the most important or the prevailing question. And it appears, because most of our audience uh, are academics and researchers in tourism, it appears that uh, unanimously, sort of unanimously, they ask, where should they focus their research? What is more catchy for the future? Of course, our colleagues, obviously, they have in the back of their minds, uh, well, what would be more easily publishable, because it would be more interesting and more uh, original and uh, uh, and more timely. So, what do you think? What is the what should be the real focus of research nowadays? I think we need to rephrase this because it's kind of a very academic question to non-academic colleagues. I, I think what what really we need to do, and going back to what Kathy was talking early on, is what do the industry need to know? What's the big questions that we need to actually research on? and take advantage of the data that they've got and the trends that they've got and bring all this knowledge together. And I'm sure that, that uh, our three speakers, because they speak with the industry all the time, they'll be very well um, aware of, of the key questions that the industry is asking every day. So I think that is the question. And academics need to find out what they will research to answer the big questions. And that's the answer to that question. So Steve? What yeah, are the I, big questions are they asking you? Uh, you know, I, I think the exceptions uh, would be a, would definitely be a place to focus. You know, why, you know, why were there destinations that actually outperformed 
uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. Why, you know, there were not all, not all hotels were created equal. Not all destinations are created equal. There, there were a lot of hotels that did better and, and it were comparatively better in 2020. And, and, you know, I, I was listening to a CEO panel recently where the CEOs were saying they've developed a, you know, during this time, they've developed much more of a war room mentality where they're getting together on a weekly basis, looking at the data, trying to, you know, looking at their portfolio and seeing which hotels are doing better and why, what are they, what do they apply, you know, what can they learn from the hotels that are doing better last week that they can apply to the other hotels. So much more a dynamic use of data and, and responding quicker, uh, and, and so I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned here. And one of those areas is starting with the exceptions. Why did the outdoor tourism, you, you know, that that's done great weekend getaways, holiday travel, uh, you know, staycations, you know, there are things, there are things that I think the hotel industry can apply into the future. And, uh, I think that's, you know, those, those are definitely some areas to start when it comes to research. Luca? Yeah, and um, I love obviously starting with why <clears throat> and why uh, happens. I think obviously I need to wear my marketing hat more than uh, my, uh, I don't have a researcher hat anyway, but uh, I think there are two, two themes that are, that are fundamental for me when I speak for, especially with destination. And uh, so I think a research around the know-how on uh, data, on data driven, on uh, how a destination really becomes uh, a data driven uh, uh, destination. That's something that uh, can be focused on the know how. And I think the risk, uh, we don't want that data becomes a, a buzzword that, uh, you know, that everyone. So it's really important to understand if the, there is an education on the destination ecosystem of these. Uh, approach of being data driven. So that's one area. And the other one I touched on my uh, presentation is regarding uh, a research that would tell like, what are the hurdles of a private and public partnerships? Why tourism is so slow compared to other industry considering that we are so transversal? Like an impact on tourism will have an impact on many economies. Why we are the slowest to adapt certain tools that many other industry already have for a long time. So that's- So it's digitization and data, data-driven decision-making uh, uh, and, and, and moving forward with the rationalization of tourism. Yeah, I think digitalization, of course, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying anything new, but as I said, like, I think I've seen too much friction between public and private and it's going to be now we need to build this barrier and uh, destroy this bar barrier and uh, build a bridge <laughs> between those two areas. Absolutely. And Alexander? Yeah, I think one of the key things that the industry needs to think of is see how can we be flexible and what can we do? So I think one way is to find out different possible consumer demands for travel in the longer term, but also to just look at your, diff look at your business what different consumer groups can I attract? What different source markets can I attract? Because one thing we've seen a lot, and we talk about lodging, for example, is that the inbound tourists have come, but instead you've filled up your hotel with a new group of local travellers. So that needs to be considered. Absolutely. And I think the, the, the issue is, there are so many issues that are coming out. And I think I think COVID is kind of, uh, it's a cold sour because for about 40 years, uh, tourism was growing nicely and everybody almost took us for granted. But I think we really need to look into the, into the real issues. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let me bring uh, my good friend Chu Long uh, all the way from Kuala Lumpur. And I know that's quite late in Kuala Lumpur. And I know that you've been patiently joining and taking notes. I know uh, uh, that, that you were taking notes about all the conversations that are happening. And um, we would like to bring you in to actually um, uh, reflect on the things that we've heard and also the things that you see from Asia and from your perspective, how things are going to do. Before we go to that, let, let uh, Evangelos uh, uh, introduce you properly. 
Thank you, Demetrius. Mr. Lee Chun Lung has over 30 years of tourism development and management experience, which included key executive positions across the hotel and travel industry. He is currently the founder and president of Discover Miles, as well as founder and convener of the World Ecotourism Conference and World Food Tourism Conference. He has also acted as consultant to the United Nations World Tourism Organization, GIZ, and governments on, strategic, on several strategic regional tourism development projects. Over the years, he has served on the board of numerous national and international tourism bodies, including three terms selected as UNWTO Affiliates Regional Vice President of East Asia and the Pacific. Mr. Lee Chun Long. And this is exactly where we work together on the affiliate members of the World Tourism Organization, and we've um, looked into different things. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Evangelos and Professor Dimitrios, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. Now this morning we have heard uh, the latest updates uh, from imminent panel members representing different segments of the industry. The insightful presentations remind us of an industry that was once responsible for 1.5 billion international tourist arrivals worldwide. In 2020, a 74% drop was recorded and 1.3 US trillion dollars of tourism exports was lost. The entire global tourism industry was brought to its knees, but the industry was also responsible for the global outbreak of COVID-19 when infected travelers flew across borders carrying the virus with them. The consequential impact across the global tourism sector arising from this tragic event, of course, has already been reported and confirmed by Alessandra of UNWTO and Mario Parra. There are no answers nor any crystal ball to tell us when uh, this unprecedented dark era will end, nor when our lifestyle returns to some semblance of normalcy. Stakeholders are not so op optimistic that it will end soon as many countries face challenges with mass vaccination programs. Although surveys have reported that international travelers pent-up appetite to travel is strong, they face psychological and financial impediments since the pandemic has caused massive unemployment, fears of infections and economic turmoil in many parts of the world. When public health authorities do decide to give the green light for international travel to resume, just like the United Kingdom and Greece, it is a relief to many. But tourism planners start to question at the back of their mind, is tourism really back to business as usual? Are we setting our goal to restore back to our old self? Or should we be taking the opportunity to reset and strive for better outcomes? Now, from my observations as a tourism entrepreneur, I strongly believe that rebounding back to what we were and where we were in 2019 would be a mistake. It would mean that we did not learn valuable lessons from this pandemic which brought the industry to a standstill. It would mean that we are ignoring the flaws and deficiencies in tourism governance and management that have contributed to many people deriding tourism and blaming tourists for the degradation of natural and cultural assets. It would mean that we are in denial of an industry that is simply not sustainable yet, nor resilient enough to face another global threat. What this industry needs is not a rebound, but a reset with resilient pathways towards a sustainable future. Restarting the global tourism industry, what are some of the strategies for the future? I think the most important strategy for the future is developing and strengthening tourism resiliency. The strategy is to develop a resiliency framework that will help to reinstate entrepreneur confidence stakeholders' financial capacity and success factors for aviation and the hospitality sector supply chains to resume operations. 
Domestic markets are expected to respond first as evidence in China and gradually international travel is expected to gain confidence and rebound in a safe manner, hopefully. However, such expectations would not realize without governments and stakeholders communicating and collaborating in resilient strategies that aims to drive the agenda. Now, some of the strategies that governments and stakeholders can undertake are lifting travel restrictions, apply new health protocols for safe travel, apply to diversify markets, as well as restoring travel confidence and stimulating demand with new safe and clean labels for the sector, introducing information apps for visitors and domestic tourism promotion campaigns. At the same time, joint action committees can start to prepare comprehensive tourism recovery plans rebuilt destinations, encourage innovation and investment and retain the future of the tourism sector. Now here are some of the specific strategies for the betterment and advancement of a new tourism era. Um, one is restoring confidence and that involves the mass vaccinations for the tourism sector. The fear and risk of contracting COVID-19 while traveling is probably the biggest deterrent to the recovery of international travel. It has been reported and widely believed that the virus infection is so contagious that no one is safe until vaccination has touched 70% of the world's population to reach herd immunity. While developed nations are expected to reach their targets by the end of the year, the slow rollout of vaccinations in developing countries in Asia is of great concern as it may take several months more before emerging communities can even get their vaccine supplies. For this reason, the global tourism sector will most likely see earlier, earliest tourist traffic rebound only in the developed countries this year. The other one is, the other strategy that stakeholders should consider is developing COVID-19 travel insurance policy. Stakeholders need to be aware that Travel insurance which covers COVID-19 treatment may become a necessity for travelers in future. It may be just a piece of paper, but travelers expect that such insurance available and some countries have already mandated this as a prerequisite before entry. Reopening borders. Multilateral agreement on health protocols and health certificates. Just two years ago, we took air travel for granted. Just click and book a ticket, grab your passport, and you're on your way. However, the pandemic has created a unique situation now where countries need to collaborate and agree to a set of acceptable health checks and protocols for travelers. Hence, travel bubbles were born primarily to ensure that travelers would not import or export the virus. However, challenges are exacerbated by different health standards in each country, and trust needs to be established. And just imagine when there are three or over 200 over countries in the world. Next is government financial support and incentives. When governments impose lockdowns on travel restrictions, it's essentially choked the tourism industry. Without revenue streams, tourism stakeholders cannot sustain their business. Financially weakened, allocating government support incentives is necessary to motivate tourism stakeholders to reboot, as well as boost interest in domestic tourism. For example, the Indonesian government has set aside 443 billion rupiah, which is equivalent to slightly about USD 30 million to incentivize domestic tourists to visit any of the 10 promoted tourist destinations. The South Korean government has provided financial support to the domestic tourism industry to stabilize employment amid the fallout from the pandemic. Essentially, it is feeding financial aid to create and retain jobs. The Malaysian government allocated 113 million US dollars in the form of travel discount, vouchers, tax relief, and increased promotional support. Another important strategy is the investment in digital technology applications. The industry moving forward require better forecast markets, model scenarios, and understand risks 
using innovative business intelligence solutions. Data analytics is required to monitor changes in consumer behavior and assist in destination management and marketing. Since there is a transformation in the industry, reskilling human capital and transforming hospitality operations is essential. Today's hospitality is being transformed into a 100% digital technology enabled industry powered by online mobile cloud IoT tools and applications. Digital technology is making its way into every aspect of the industry and to prepare for the transformation, strategic action plans needs to reskill human capital. Strengthening domestic tourism, as we've heard a lot this morning, curation of domestic tourism experiences. Research surveys have indicated that due to restrictions in international travel, domestic demand will likely fuel the recovery of tourism in the form of staycations, clamping, family travel, ecotourism, and luxury accommodation. A strong domestic tourism industry can boost the resilience of the tourism industry and softening future shocks. However, small island developing countries have reported challenges in this area and still depend on international tourists. Rural and outdoor destinations is the focal point. Post-pandemic times may affect the appeal of many to crowded tourist spots now deemed too risky. They may in turn, may all go well for less popular, less populated regions by providing them the opportunity to improve their appeal as potential tourism destinations. This is an opportune time for destinations to strengthen and diversify their natural and cultural attractions, encourage curation of innovative visitor experiences and handicrafts. Another important part, which I heard a lot this morning, is public-private people collaboration and cooperation. PPPs, the four Ps bring industry practitioners and communities together to develop domestic tourism with shared prosperity. It has proven to be highly successful in rural areas where tourism revenue has benefited the local communities and revitalized rural resources. Studies have shown that destination preference trends tend to skew to more nature-based outdoor areas and small community villages. These provide opportunities for careful development of new tourism spots and less developed destinations that benefits the resident communities. Facilitating tourism sectors organizational transformation. This pandemic will contribute to creating new tourism business models and perhaps even the definitions of it, which will be essentially determines the industry's chances of survival. At the same time, the industry can no longer operate in silo. As the pandemic has shown us that the tourism industry is very much interconnected to other sectors and fields of which tourism stakeholders have no clue. For example, health, environment, zoology, sociology, and so forth. The next normal in the tourism sector will need to incorporate different disciplines in their business and, and services. So what's next is, transforming stakeholders to be conscientious of sustainable practices and promote respectful tourism. <clears throat> a conception to instill respect of host communities, culture, traditions, and customs when traveling in line with the catchphrase, travel, enjoy, respect. <clears throat> the strategy is promoting a knowledge-based and data-driven industry through partnerships between academicians and tourism practitioners. This will enable knowledge translation to tourism business applications and strategies, creating real and meaningful impacts. This particularly holds true in sustainable tourism, ecotourism, and tourism segments related to science and data. Reviewing and improving legislation and business ethics. As a result of unrefunded deposits held by airlines, governments, need to revise and improve regulatory regime surrounding cancellations and passenger refunds. It is also time for governments to revise their tourism legislation and regulations to be in tandem with increasing 
adoption of digital processes, and in particular, the transformation of brick and mortar businesses to click and book businesses. Enhancing tourism governance and destination management based on digital economy strategies. Developing countries are encouraged to adopt digital economy strategies as tools for betterment of destination management, conscientiously curating tourism experiences and services that is tied to the sense of place and meets the expectations of consumers. It develops community participation and responsibility and inculcates sustainably tourism development in tourism destinations. Now this is a, a massive exercise and while waiting for borders to open, tourism proponents and practitioners can get busy on this. Last is multilateral regional strategies. As long haul travel is expected to rebound last, equally important are regional resiliency strategies that help to facilitate regional travel. In 2016, I drafted three strategic development declarations for Laos and Cambodia, including the FATSE Declaration on ASEAN Roadmap for Strategic Development of Ecotourism Clusters and Tourism Corridors. The pandemic has elevated the urgency of such regional strategies and roadmaps to expedite operations, boosting cross-border tourism and facilitating travel under proper health procedures and protocols. This by no means is an exhaustive list that can be Taken in future, it is due to time constraint that I have to leave up the others, which is climate action and sustainable tourism, which can be discussed in another forum. Uh, these important actionable areas of great concern and expected to impact the future of tourism. As you can see, there's a lot to do in the aftermath of the pandemic to stimulate the recovery of tourism. However, it is important that academicians, tourism researchers, and planners play a pivotal role in contributing to the development of a new tourism era. A new chapter that people can travel, enjoy, and conscientiously respect the natural and cultural attractions so that the future generations can continue to do the same. I thank you. Thank you very much, Long. Uh, now you understand why I kept you to the last uh, speaker because you kind of brought everything together in a, an incredibly good summary of, of uh, 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 synthesizing all the views. And actually I'd like to keep two words uh, from what you said uh, that, that people should take with them. One is the transformation of tourism that we experience. And many of us were this morning in Hong Kong talking about the, the great Bay Area and the smart tourism that they're trying to bring there in order to build different things. And we see around the world all kinds of transformational uh, 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 initiatives to take us somewhere uh, better. And you encapsulate that with the, with the word respect. We need to respect locals, resources, environments, and, and everything else. And I, uh, I know that we've gone over the time and Vangelis is not going to be very happy because we are half an hour more than the time that we are allocated. But I think the ideas that we encapsulated in these two and a half hours have been incredible. And I really uh, thank you all for your contribution. I'll go back to Vangelis to close the session. Thank you. Thank you, Demetrius. Uh, absolutely, it was it was brilliant. I I, I keep receiving uh, an inflow of uh, messages from participants, from delegates that are really really excited with uh, this uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank all uh, panelists, uh, every each one of you. I mean, you did a really really impressive work. Uh, above all, I would like to thank uh, Demetrius for organizing this initially, for uh, having this idea about this panel, organizing it and moderating it so effectively. Thank you all. Greatly appreciated. 